meeting being called back to order and pub, uh, to public session. And thank you for your patience for uh, uh, waiting for us to get back. But there is nothing to report out from closed session. And, um, and what I'd like to do is for you to all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, if you would remain standing for just a moment afterwards um, to have a moment of silence for Parkland. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, let's move to adopt the agenda. Is there, are there any changes that anyone sees or anything we need to pull before adopting the agenda? It's nothing from staff. Okay. Move to adopt agenda, anyone? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Aye. agenda adopted. All right, and now we have our Police Academy presentation. Welcome. Welcome, Damien. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. We're I bring with me you. tonight three guest speakers. Under Sheriff Gene Donaldson from the Napa County Sheriff's Department, Captain John Whitney from the Vallejo Police Department, and Officer Marianne Grubb from the Walnut Creek Police Department. Each will give a unique perspective, if you will, and information for you to consider regarding our program here at the Napa Valley College at the Police Academy. Thank you all, all very much. Under Sheriff. Good evening. Uh, I'm, like you said, I'm on Under Sheriff Gene Donaldson. Uh, I've been with the Napa County Sheriff's Office for 30 years now. I'm very pleased to. Uh, to be here tonight to share my perspective on the role of the Napa Valley College Criminal Justice Training Program. Um, within Napa County, the Sheriff's Office and the other law enforcement agencies, um, we employ very many graduates of uh, this really great program. And uh, if you ever interact with any law enforcement official in, in our county, um, there's a good chance that they are a graduate of uh, the Police Academy here. Um, we have come to know the uh, academy graduates as being well equipped to do their job. Uh, their training focuses on preparing them for the best chance of success in a very demanding field, a field that gets harder and harder, it seems, uh, every year. Officers and deputies enjoy a challenge rewarding career and rewarding career. In our county, many of the Napa Valley College graduates have risen through the ranks and serve in supervisory and, and command level uh, positions in, in every department. Uh, I consider it an honor to serve the Napa County uh, communities and uh, our motto at the Napa County Sheriff's Office is commitment to community and it's very uh, rewarding and, and, and I'm, I'm very pleased that we have such a great uh, training facility in our community and we have folks here that are committed to the community as well. Um, as you're aware, the Criminal Justice uh, Training Advisory Committee supports the basic academy program and co is comprised of chiefs, sheriffs, and other command level uh, personnel from Napa and Solano counties. Um, and we provide uh, recommendations and guidance on uh, CGTC policies, procedures, and training. I've been a sitting member on this committee for uh, many years now, and this committee is aware of and supports the very high academic and physical skill standards that are in place here. Uh, in short, the Police Academy and the Criminal Justice Training Program at the Napa Valley College is an outstanding program. 
and I'm very proud to be associated with such a fine group of dedicated instructors and administrators. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is John Whitney. I'm a captain with the Loyal Police Department. I have been there, I've been in law enforcement 22 years. And I am proud to say I'm a graduate of Napa Valley College Police Academy. In fact, uh, Chief Arnold was my coordinator in class 26 back in 1994 when I graduated. Uh, sorry, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> I knew when I was attending the academy that someday I would uh, want to return. I was very impressed with the instruction and the professionalism of the staff, and I wanted to be a part of it. So 13 years ago, I was hired as an instructor with the police academy and been here ever since, teaching a variety of topics. When you go through the police training, you come to understand the rigors and the, the natures of the work, but it isn't until you reflect on the training over time that you grasp the meaning of the many lessons you learn uh, during the police academy. After working in the field, uh, the substantial importance of, importance of retaining those lessons become very apparent. Consequently, I think it's important to get back to the profession, and that's why I returned back to the police academy uh, some time ago. Within this program, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, over 100 instructors in both scenarios, drill instructors, uh, physical training instructors, firearm instructors uh, throughout uh, the region. Uh, I think it's great that 40% of the staff is actually a graduate of Napa Valley College Police Academy. It says a lot about the program and the professionalism and the type of student that they are producing. The requirements to work here are formidable. Meeting minimum qualifications takes experience, education, and perhaps the most important aspect is putting the students first ahead of uh, ourselves while we're teaching the class. In addition to providing excellent training, our academy encourages recruiters to visit. And through the last five academies, we've had over 40 uh, recruitments uh, and recruiters show up uh, per session. And the recruiters have come all over the state and each agency offers just a little bit different uh, kind of a compensation package for the officer they're trying to hire or deputy sheriff. Um, students entering the field uh, earn a very good living. They start anywhere from $50,000 uh, up to six figures and some Bay Area agencies. Salary is important, but moreover, it's the, the working environment and some of the benefits that the officers receive to um, both insurance, retirement, and the benefits to assist them in, in raising their families. Finally, the cadets graduating in Napa Valley Police Academy have uh, an 83% chance of getting a job in their first year, and that says a lot about the training that the staff is providing the students. Uh, in closing, thoughtful, purposeful training is delivered on a daily basis. The leadership within the program promotes leadership within our students. And through the commitment and enthusiasm, the academy staff has been contributing to law enforcement profession, the future and the future of these students. Thank you. Captain Whitney. I have a question. Yes. So, well, I noticed because I come to the police academy graduations in the five years, I think I've only missed one because I was just way too sick to make, make it there that day. Um, but I noticed that Vallejo does take, that a lot of our students are already going to work for the Vallejo Police Department. Is there, and, and maybe Director Sandoval, maybe this is to you, is there a, a measurement after they leave uh, that says, here's the success or, or, or follows what happens to, you know, our people. Is there some sort of uh, measurement of that? I, I think I can answer a little bit and then uh, um, Mr. Sandoval should probably answer the rest. I think it really depends on the agency and it depends where they work. Some agencies such as Vallejo, if you're familiar with our our crime statistics, it's a very fast city to work in. Officers can have anywhere up to 30 calls for service per shift. Um, sometimes that appeals to some officers, sometimes it doesn't. And although not every officer who comes to Vallejo is successful, we, we make a very good effort knowing where they came from and what training we provided to assist them in finding jobs with other agencies that might be closer to their skill level. And since I have been involved with the hiring process over the past five years, I've only had one 
officer leave our agency who we couldn't find them another job if they weren't successful with us. Now, I don't know if there's a metric from other agencies that Mr. Sandoval is aware of, um, but it really, in my opinion, depends on the agency and also depends on the officer and how willing they are to. Really, we look at the, uh, the field training program that follows the academy as an extension academy. The academy gets ready for their very first day in law enforcement, and it's up to the departments to provide the field training over six to nine months to help them become successful officers. It's how much effort they put into that training program really resonates and in, in what kind of officer they become. That's a critical time and they're like a sponge and they absorb a lot of what we're putting into them. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, and it, it would be really interesting to see like yourself, right? As somebody who has risen uh, to a captain level position and how many graduates do we have out there who are um, in those upper ranks uh, and what kind of success uh, there is, so. Uh, being involved in the program, I can say this much as the, the pretty much the person who decides which academy they go to, uh, my first choice is to send them here. Thank you, thank you so much, that was great. great thank you. Good evening, my name is Mary Ann Grubb and I'm very excited to be here on behalf of the Napa Valley College Criminal Justice Training Center. I'm a graduate, class 76, from December of 09, and I am one of those 83% who managed to get a job within my first year of graduating from the program. And now I'm a very proud and happy officer with the city of Walnut Creek. I made the commitment to enter this profession relatively late in life, uh, very late, at age 37, I did not take this decision lightly. I knew, though, that my fundamental basic training was going to shape the rest of my career. So I visited several academies across the state, and I came up to Napa, and I observed the staff and the cadets from afar, the far west parking lot. Um, and then eventually I creeped in a little bit closer, but um, it didn't take me long to realize that it was going to be this program that prepared me for the challenges that laid ahead. And let me tell you, I made the best decision of my life coming here. I absolutely loved my academy experience, um, and I was sad to see it come to an end. From the moment Academy Secretary Mrs. Brooke Jackson assisted me with the enrollment process, I realized <clears throat> that I'd be treated with respect and dignity and care. I knew immediately if this was the kind of attention and service that the staff provided, that the program would be truly committed to uh, students. It wasn't until I met the drill instructors on day one of the academy that I realized just how intensely caring that this program would be. Although the intensity and gravity of the training was a revelation to me, it was very clear to me that the staff was dedicated to every student's success, including giving them every possible tool to hopefully ensure that they went home at the end of their shift. The 22 weeks of training was transformational for me. I developed skills and abilities that translate across every aspect of my life today. Every inspection, lesson, learning activity, quiz, test, and manipulative skill session supported the six <clears throat> identified student learning outcomes. I paid attention to these because I came from the educational field. In my previous life, I was a high school math teacher and a cross country coach. So I understand the importance of linking the classroom and the field activities to the desirable learning outcomes. And that ability is a hallmark of our program here. Upon graduating, I immediately started the required certification program necessary to be an instructor at the academy. It was important to me to give back to the program that changed my life. In addition, I wanted to develop a more dynamic, specifically directed lifetime fitness program to help students prepare for what I learned to be the rigors of the profession. It is my distinct pleasure to be the lead fitness instructor for this police academy. Our team of instructors aims to instill a love for fitness while pushing the cadets harder than they thought that they were ever capable of working. As I move forward in my career, I will remain ever thankful and supportive of the Napa Valley College Criminal Justice Training Center. As I continue my training for the city of Walnut Creek and training classes for the college, 
I visit training academies across the state, and each and every time when I walk away, I know how fortunate I am to be connected with such a highly regarded program as Napa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all three of you so much for coming and sharing your perspectives. It has been my great pleasure over the last nine years and now on my 10th year to be the director of this program. I'm a member of a team that is truly committed to the students. And that is that means everything to us. That we are successful with our students. The recent wildfires in October brought home a very huge lesson for all of us. When we traveled into the fire zone to try and help, we met students that came, graduates that came from Alameda County, Contra Costa County, from as far away as San Jose, Santa Clara County, and from regions north, um, Arcata, and different departments that were all graduates from our program. And they were working checkpoints. And as we were driving through, we were getting to meet these students again. And to me, that was a very powerful reminder of how important it is that we do appropriate training delivered carefully, specifically, diligently. And we strive for that every day. We have a memorial, and I invite you to go and see it. It's on the west side of our building, the 1000 building. And there are two names on that memorial. Fortunately, just two names, graduates of our program. Ricky Del Fiorentino, who was ambushed and murdered way up at the north end of the state. And Jermaine Gibson, who passed away in a car accident chasing a suspect in the very southern region of our state. Our impact is far reaching. And I think it's important that we kind of pause and, and tell ourselves, we're sending people into harm's way. This training is absolutely very, very important. I am currently sitting as the president of the California Academy Directors Association. And so I want you to know Napa Valley does have impact across the state in the direction of training and the importance of the content of the training. And I don't say that to impress you, but rather to impress upon you the value that we place on what we deliver to our students. It is our pleasure to serve here at Napa Valley College. It is a tremendous environment to be a part of. We work with wonderful people, and I can't thank you enough for letting us all come and share a bit of ourselves with you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? We can't thank you enough. Yes, please, any questions? Thank you for coming today. My yes, question is uh, along the lines of campus safety. It's not every time we have so many police officers here at the meeting, and my question is, what is Napa Valley College doing to make sure what happened in Parkland does not happen here? And another, another part of it is, uh, is, there a, is there a procedure that if there is an active gunman on campus, does the police academy mobilize maybe to contain that, or would that go straight to campus police? Uh, I think uh, Chief Arnold will be able to respond to both of those questions because that is not our bailiwick. We are a training program. And so safety, as far as we are concerned, deals with how we handle our firearms, which we don't handle on campus at all. They all, we do all of that in Fairfield at an enclosed range. So that, that danger doesn't exist here. We do drive vehicles and we're very, very aware. And the Commission on Post, Peace Officer Standards and Training, has very strict guidelines and mandates regarding how we deliver that and they audit that frequently. And so those are the safeguards we have in place for safety as far as our program is concerned. Regarding your question on campus security, that might be a better question for Chief Arnold and perhaps offline. Uh, Ms. Mancuso, I would like to respond to your question about the metric yes. for success retaining officers. What we've just recently begun doing within the last five years is auditing what, what are called post-identification numbers. There are unique numbers assigned to each individual that goes through our program. The minute they are enrolled, they get that number. And then we can audit that number with the Commission on Post and ask them if they are still employed. And so we do that frequently, and the success rate in field training is almost a direct reflection of the success rate of our program. So the, it, the mirror image is there. So to, to put it this way, you have a percentage chance of being successful in our program, but that percentage chance still exists for the first year that you are out in the field because that year is a probation period that is really effectively part of the hiring process. And so when you think about it, the hiring process for a police officer spans about a year and a half. And that's for most agencies in the state. It's arduous. 
So we are tracking that and we'll get stats, we'll have better stats down the road as we go. That would be great to see. And right. um, one other question. So I noticed that often at the graduations that uh, a number of our cadets are employed already, right? Yes. Is there, uh, is there a percentage of the ones who are not employed, are they a part of that percentage of who gets employed and in what period of time? Those, those were the only ones we were speaking of. So that 83%, Okay. that's 83% of those who graduate and are hired within the first year after graduation. That's not counting the ones that are already hired when they come through. Okay. Increasingly, and related to that question, we're having recruiters come in and hire on the spot at our, in our program. The chief of police from a, from a local agency came in and based on our recommendation, sat down with just three students, interviewed them, offered one of them a job. And so by the end of the, gradu by the, end of the program, that student will have patches on his or her shoulder. So that's how it works. It's, you know, to it. reframe uh, our student trustees' question, is there anything different in the training now in regards to the school shootings? There is, and, and it happens at the in-service level for officers that come out into the field and how they respond to active shooters. What we've added to our program as far as information and protection and awareness is that every one of them is a set of eyes for everyone else on this campus to keep safe. And so when they're here and they're eating lunch or they're out in, the com out in the campus community, they have eyes open for who might be a potential threat, who's acting strangely, who might we want to react to. And so they are aware and they're aware how to get a hold of PD. If I could tell a real quick story about that. Yeah, yeah, please. They're pretty aware. In fact, the other day in the lunchroom, one of our students was watching another student eat and she began to choke badly. He was able to administer the Heimlich maneuver and two other students assisted and effectively they probably saved her life. EMS came out, responded, and was able to take over. But the Heimlich maneuver uh, caused the food to eject. And so they were so pumped up when they came back to class after lunch, it was great. Those are the kinds of things we wanted to pay attention to. How are things around you? Are people safe? I had a quick question. What's unique about Napa that's a challenge? The unique challenge we have is we have six core competencies competencies that we've identified and we've distilled those out of the 11 competencies. We've consolidated them to, to make six core competencies and we require that in those core competencies each of our students achieve a minimum level of 80% success in all tests and manipul manipulative skills. Those core competencies um, relate are very closely related to the six student learning outcomes. And so nowhere else in the state does that competency, does that standard exist. We piloted that in 2009, my first year here. I went to the advisory committee, asked for their support. They supported it on a pilot basis. We did it for a year. We were able to achieve good success. We've stuck with it ever since. And we haven't seen a drop in our attrition, an increase in our attrition level or a a drop in our achievement level since. So we raised the bar and the students rose up to meet it. And our instructors had to rise up because their lesson plans had to be much more specified and uh, the activities very clarified. It's impressive, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all, good night. See you at the next graduation. <laughs> All right, now we move to 8.1 public comment. Presentation to the board about, oh, sorry. What did that get under public comment guidelines at this time? Sorry about that. The board will devote a total of up to 15 minutes for comments to the Board of Trustees regarding any subject not appearing as an agenda item for this meeting, but over which the board has jurisdiction. The public may ask the board to place an item related to the business of the district on a future board agenda. No action or discussion will occur at this time, and such items, individuals, be limited to a five-minute presentation. At this time, the board chair will pull those in attendance uh, regarding their intent to speak. I also want to mention that uh, members of the public who wish to speak on a specific agenda item will be invited to speak either before or after the staff presentation for that item.
public comment will be closed in advance of board deliberation. And let me uh, look at the cards here. I have a card from Mr. Gary Orton. Members of the board, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge and thank your board secretary, Ms. Cottrell, uh, for making a change to the uh, website. Um, I was getting real frustrated going in and trying to find the agenda, and it took me about four or five hits and going down all these things. And, and I, being somewhat knowledgeable about the Brown Act, I pointed out that the Brown Act was amended uh, in 2016 to require that all local jurisdictions, all local agencies have the agenda for the board, me board uh, meetings be on the home page to make it easier for the public to find the agendas. So after a couple of conversations, uh, she was very uh, patient with me, um, and she was very prompt, and actually made some really great improvements to the, um, to the website. So now, just go over to, um, when you go to the homepage, at the right-hand side, there's a button there. And not only that, the Brown Act required, and she came up with a really great um, method of searching for agendas. So if you, ha you, know, so if you go to the, into the agendas, and you'll see a search there, you can search, and it's a new, improved search, she did a really great job with that too. Um, so that very nicely arranged the various minutes on your search term. So again, I'd like to uh, thank her. Kudos to her. Thank you. And then um, on public comment, we also have Mr. James Hinton, but I don't see him. All right. We will move on to uh, constituent group reports. And we'll start with uh, Amanda Badgett. Good evening, board. Cynthia, could you bring it up, please? Thanks. So in lieu of my report tonight, I would actually like to read to you a resolution. It says up there proposed. It was actually approved by the Academic Senate on the 13th of February, 2018, regarding um, a resolution in support of DACA students. So with your forbearance, I'd like to read it to you. Whereas the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges has affirmed that the California Community College system is committed to serving all students who can benefit from a post-secondary education without regard to race, ethnicity, religion, national origin, immigration status, age, gender, language, socioeconomic status, gender identity or expression, medical condition or disability, and whereas the Board of Trustees of Napa Valley College adopted a resolution referencing the paragraph above and resolved that Napa Valley College joins the California Community College's Board of Governors declaring that we, along with other community colleges, will remain open, safe, and welcoming to all students who meet the minimum requirements for admission regardless of immigration status, and that financial aid remains available to certain undocumented students, and that Napa Valley College joins the Board of Governors and the Chancellor's Office in encouraging all community college districts to ensure that all students have an opportunity to receive an education in the community college system, regardless of immigration status and any other protected status. And whereas the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA program, which provides the opportunity for undocumented students meeting certain criteria to pursue their educational goals without threat of deportation may be discontinued in the near future. And whereas California Community College Chancellor Eloy Ortiz Oakley has stated in response to the possibility of DACA being discontinued that, quote, we remain committed to serving and supporting all students regardless of immigration status, and seeing that they reach their full potential, we will stand with our students and we will not give in to fear, and quote, a position supported by the NVC Superintendent President, Dr. Ron Kraft. And whereas the Academic Senate shares the resolve that the college remain open, safe, and welcoming to all students, regardless of immigration status, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Academic Senate of Napa Valley College remains committed 
to supporting student success for all students, regardless of immigration status or changes to DACA, and will strive to identify and implement any legal options available to faculty to allow impacted students to continue their education with or without DACA protection. And this was unanimously approved on February 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, I'd just like to share the thank you from my vantage point, Academic Senate, um, uh, undertaking something like this says it's a, it's a good statement, as, as we've talked about, and I appreciate it, and I'm sure the community does as well. All right, Administrative Con Confidential Senate Report, Chief Ken Arnold. So, uh, so as a Senate, we continue to meet uh, and have regular meetings, and uh, frankly, we've been going over some of the business processes. Probably more on a, on a more exciting note is what's going on with leadership program, because I always try to use that as an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, the leadership group is uh, continuing to meet. We've created a leadership lending library for alumni, and we've been uh, starting to roll that out. The other thing that's exciting that the leadership program has done is we're going to uh, identify alumni who are willing to be leadership coaches for all new incoming employees by um, uh, April. As a part of the orientation, they'll be able to request if they'd like to have a coach, which is uh, somebody who's just a one-on-one -on -one person who's going to check with them, give them, help them sort of get used to the college. Maybe if they hear terms that they're not sure of, you know, they come in and say, you know, I heard uh, IIPI, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me? You know, and then there's a one-on-one -on -one personal connection for them to, you know, to discuss the various nuances because, uh, you know, we, we do love our acronyms at community colleges. Um, and so it's a way of, of doing that. So we're excited by that program. There's a direct application of what the leadership program has eventually done here. So we've gone from just teaching theory now to that practical application. Thank That's you. That's all I got. Associate. Chair. Chair. Yes. Um, could I ask uh, Mr. Arnold a question right now? Absolutely. It, it wouldn't be regarding his position on the board, but as, a, as the campus police head. Mm -hmm. um, one question I have okay. is, in high schools, I know they have drills for earthquakes and mm -hmm. active shooters and everything. At the college, do we do drills for active shooters? So uh, actually, for high schools, you're only required to do fire drills. Okay. Um, actually, they don't. They um, so uh, with the college, it's a little more difficult. We do a drill once a year. Uh, every two years, we do a full blown evacuation of the camp or evacuation drill out to the emergency sites. We provide training on active shooter response, both through video literature and one on one in in classes. So that's what we're providing to the people. We also have a robust program, uh, one of the few who do uh, behaviors of concern, and we do that throughout the college. We have an extensive system for evaluating potential threats. Um, it's a multi-page, very uh, uh, definite training uh, that we've done that for a better part of 15 years in conjunction with the FBI. There's a number of things that go on behind the scenes. We don't really advertise a lot of that. I mean, we do for the public for one aspect, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on also in terms of our preparation. Um, we are very fortunate. We receive outstanding training from the Sheriff's Department, uh, very advanced, very, very advanced training. Um, and uh, my folks have an extremely good skill set. Um, so we just don't advertise it. Thank you. Thank you. Associated Students of Napa Valley College Report, President Rafael Manzo. Okay. Good evening. Uh, I'm sorry that I missed the February meeting. It was purely accidental, I assure you. Um, and I was devastated when I realized it. It's funny, um, Tristy Segura was the one who reminded me. And I was like shocked. I was like, the February board meeting, I don't know how I missed it. I really don't. Uh, know how that escaped my calendar. I'm usually really thorough. Um, so I'm happy to be back. Uh, happy March. Um, in February, though, um, the Black History Month celebration event um, that we co-collaborated with um, was quite the success, and we were really happy to see um, quite a few of you uh, who, who were able to make it. Um, thank you, trustees. 
Um, you know, it's it's this part of this greater conversation that we've been having in uh, equity and inclusivity committee, uh, which I have served as a student representative on for about two or three years now, um, and sort of the conversation began there and then started to evolve, um, which was about commemorative months and how those are acknowledged here um, on campus. Uh, commemorative and cultural heritage months, basically. Um, given that there are so many uh, commemorative months on a national or international level on the calendar, um, how do we then begin to approach which ones to acknowledge in some sort of visual way that has like a visual presence on campus? Um, and and who, who then is in charge of, of that, um, organizing events or little um, decorative or informative pieces, maybe installations of sorts. Uh, like at the library, there's a display that usually um, library staff is very um, sharp about, you know, showcasing specific commemorative or cultural heritage months. Um, and so that's kind of where those conversations began. Um, and ASNVC, you know, we used to almost single-handedly host the Black History Month celebration event. And so now that we have Craig Alamo, Dr. Craig Alamo, the, the um, Director of Equity and Inclusivity on campus, he's, you know, really taken us up on being the spearhead for those sorts of things and um, trying to see if across campus we can't find a way to collaborate to put those events on. And it's not just falling on any one group, whether it's us or another group like Puente or SSS Trio, EOPS, et cetera, um, for, for those sorts of events. So this is like the first time that we did Black History Month um, event, celebration event, as a collaborative piece among a lot of different groups. And uh, you know the way that ASNVC uh, associated with it was um, by sponsoring the uh, the food and refreshments for the event, um, and and we feel that that's a big part of culture uh, cultural events as well is the food naturally. Um, so we're happy to to do it. We're really happy to do it, and that the all the work wasn't just didn't just fall on us or anything. Um, Craig really Craig Alamo was really. Um, so great um, as the facilitator for this event. Um, it was on, it took place on February 27th. It was in the evening. Um, we had performances by a student, um, a young black artist on campus, and uh, also uh, Dr. Tia Madison, who's a professor of speech communications. She's an artist in her own right, and she performed a short piece from one of her um, one woman plays. And uh, so it was really just the essence of celebration for a cultural heritage event. And then uh, the main event was a speaker that um, we invited to the campus. He's an award-winning uh, radio personality, playwright, uh, et cetera. His name is Brian Copeland. And again, many of you were able to make it, and I hope those of you who didn't at least got the invitation all right. Um, and it, it really was quite the success, and I just want to I can't play, in, uh, play up enough how great it was that it was the first time that we really collaborated across campus to make this particular event happen. Um, so that's what I'd like to say about that. Um, coming up, uh, not this weekend, but the weekend after, uh, several members of our board are going to DC for a leadership uh, conference. And uh, so, this, so that's exciting uh, for, for those who are attending. And um, other than that, uh, elections, I mean, it's almost that time of year, certainly. Um, for, for us, uh, we serve one year term uh, from June 1st to May 31st. And so as I'm finishing up my term right now as president, um, I'm considering whether or not I should run for re-election. And all the other board members who are not graduating are also considering if they'll be running in the elections, et cetera. Um, and so election packets, you know, should, should be available um, by March 19th, very soon. And so we, we've all got to start thinking about that and how to promote it to the students at large um, for anyone who might be interested in running for a position. And last but not least, certainly not least, uh, happy International Women's Day. Yay. I will say, Rafael, that that event was amazing. I know that uh, Trustee Segura and myself were there. I can't remember if anybody else was there. You were there. And um, uh, I was very taken by uh, Tia Madison's performance. It was amazing. 
So it was a great event. Thank you so much for co-hosting that. All right, and uh, next is Classified Association Report, Jan Shart, and she is not here. Did you? Okay. <laughs> now we're, we're finishing each other's sentences, right? Mm -hmm. Classified Senate Report, Michael Rayford, who is also not here, but guess who is here? Christy Iwamoto. <laughs> And I think we're going to hear from her tonight. Yes, I think you are. Yeah, I normally, I normally try to go, everything's good. Um, but tonight, uh, I do have a concern. The faculty has directed me to make a statement here tonight about the district's policies and procedures regarding discipline and complaints. Uh, for weeks, the district has been in the midst of revamping and reintroducing their administrative policies. And many important policies are right now missing from the Human Resources website. The district has made assurances that these procedures are being updated and will be made public shortly, but meanwhile, the process itself continues. Without specifically outlined timelines and a published process, there's no way to assure my members that all faculty are being treated equitably under the same rules. Additionally, changes have been made in the handling of these issues, namely who is in charge of investigating complaints and contacting faculty, but these changes have not been communicated to the members. As a result, faculty are hearing from various people and the process is not consistent. This inconsistency and lack of communication increases the risk of liability to the district, leaves our faculty feeling unprotected, and creates a climate of fear and mistrust. Given that there are faculty undergoing a nebulous process, the Faculty Association respectfully requests that clarification and writing of these policies and procedures concerning discipline and complaints, uh, uh, or sorry, re request clarification and writing of these uh, policies and procedures by the Thursday before spring break. Thursday before spring break. Okay. I'm writing it down. I would comment quickly that um, the Council of Presidents is doing a wonderful job in leading the charge on review of all of the, the policies. And um, part of that is such a huge job. The HR is under review, as you know. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, as we discussed, I'll dig in and, and make sure that you get a, uh, an answer specifically on this one and see whether we can get um, up, update those um, ahead of the Q. So, because they're, uh, I think they're important and they're timely right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Now we'll move on to Superintendent Chair. President's report. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, for the constituent reports, if Raphael, uh, President Monzo, can't make it, he would he tells me what to report out and he does a really good job to do that so the board knows what the associated students are doing my question is uh the classified senate and the classified association don't give reports as often and i am curious to know who holds them accountable to make sure that they report to us on what they do that would be me um, the, um, generally what I do is send, in fact, always send an email to the constituent, um, folks. Um, again, now we have other options to meet, you know, face to face, the academic senates meet during the, during the month generally. And I sometimes am there. Um, I, I'm hesitant to share as the spokesperson for either one of those, those units, which is inappropriate. Um, but, but I make sure that they know that they're invited and, um, it's, uh, that's, but that's about it, right? I mean, so if they were here and there were significant issues, um, if there were significant issues, they would be here. You can, you can kind of guarantee that. So in, in some regards, um, silence in some ways is, is good, but I, to, your, to your point, it would be great to hear more often from them. And, I'll, and based on this, I'll, I'll send this out, which is, hey, you were missed, and we'll see what we can do. I only ask because uh, if Raphael... President Monzo didn't do it. The student association would be would would tell him, and uh, our coordinator of student life would make sure that someone was coming to these meetings, because it is imperative that we know what's going on on the campus. Thank you. So, Ron, what I take from what you just said is that the constituent groups are invited, but there's not a requirement or 
accountability for them to, right. to be exactly here. Right, exactly right, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, okay, back to 10.1, Napa Valley College Foundation. Good evening, board. So um, I'm happy to report that our scholarship season is underway, and um, thanks to Valerie, we've joined the 21st century. So um, all the students who receive a scholarship must apply through AwardSpring, which is the software that we use. And um, the faculty and individual reviewers who select the students can now do all that online. So we're really excited about that. Um, still, we're just, I think we just received a, a grant from the, finally from the um, California Community Colleges for fire relief. That's pretty much ended. Still minor, minor gifts coming in from the annual appeal. We are um, happy to announce that we have two new board members, Dave Dozier and Locke Reed, and they, they bring with them a lot of experience. And we also have two more coming, which I'll announce at the next meeting. So we're um, really, our board is making great headway in increasing their numbers. And thanks again to Bob Parker for working with Glenna to um, get our financial uh, books in shape. We now have a bookkeeper who's going to be um, working with Glenna and Bob when we move up to Salesforce. So we're really excited about that as well. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Anything to add, Ron? Or? No, I, I want to thank Anne and the foundation. Great work. Um, the foundation over the past couple years and now with Anne is um, very much at the forefront. Um, great supporters. And as she knows, and we've, we've talked, um, scholarship for students um, is huge. And there was a couple reports just this week, maybe today from the chancellor's office, which basically said a little gift goes a long way. So um, the, the annual fund and scholarship funds are well taken. And then the project-based work you're doing for the ASNVC in terms of the Student Activity Center has been Hugely wonderful, and we're enjoying that. And I want to thank you. And then the um, VWT, the Viticulture and Winery Technology Program, um, you're reaching out to the Vintners Association, right? And grape growers as well, or no? Yes, to get input to help undergird what the community wants and will support in terms of a capital campaign that you're launching. So good luck on that. And, and the board's behind you. They adopted a resolution a year ago in support of that. And if you haven't used Salesforce, you're going to love it. I've been a Salesforce administrator. It rocks. Wow. There you go. All right. Cabinet reports will be fairly easy tonight. Um, I, I would say that Oscar is away and sends his regards. And um, Char Oberon is um, ill and could not make tonight's meeting. So maybe start with Eric. Um, sure. Good evening, Board of Trustees. So I've just got a couple of things for you here tonight. Um, first off, I wanted to report back on a, a, a large undertaking that instruction has been involved in over the last year that finally came to fruition this last month. It had been put off, unfortunately, by the fires. These, uh, we had some meetings that were originally scheduled for the week of October 9th, which did not materialize. Um, I mentioned this uh, during my last board report. These are meetings that we organized uh, with our faculty and their counterparts at the high schools from each of the uh, districts here in our service area. Um, so what we did on February 9th and on March 2nd is that we got two faculty members from our uh, English department for the February 9th meeting and then from the math department for the March 2nd meeting, uh, the department chair plus one other uh, brave volunteer uh, to come on up to the Upper Valley campus and meet with a member of the math department from each of the high schools, uh, again on March 2nd, and a faculty member from each of the high schools from the English department on the 9th of February. Um, we also had administrators from all of the districts present. We had a couple of superintendents president, uh, present as well at the beginning of the meetings. Um, what we were doing with these meetings is that uh, this is something that we had done many, many years ago under the auspices of a grant where we had funded a large day where everybody went up to Mont LaSalle together and, and did a retreat and did some curricular work and some alignment analysis, gap analysis of curriculum and things like that. And it was a wonderful event that happened. It happened once. 
Um, some changes were made, but over time, people get busy, budgets change, and um, it, it hadn't happened for a very long time. So we, we, were, um, we were at a point where we felt that this was a very important step for us to take, given many of the issues that we're facing here at the college right now and some of our impending uh, legislation that's coming down as well. Um, wonderful, wonderful days. Uh, so these were, uh, we were there from 8 a.m. till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, both days. Uh, the faculty got together. I took all the administrators to another room so that we were not interfering in their process, uh, which the high school teachers in particular thanked me for. Um, at, the, at the last meeting, they said that they don't get very many chances to have those sorts of discussions, um, uh, sans their administrative staff around them. Um, so it was a really, really good days. And what we were focusing on in this is that we had our faculty go in with our career curriculum. So they had course outlines of record, they had textbooks, they had uh, sample assessments, they had all sorts of instructional material with them to present to the high school faculty what it is that we do in our classes and, what, and to outline what some of our entry uh, expectations for entry skills are. Likewise, the high school faculty brought in all of their material and explained to our faculty what it is that students are leaving their classes with or not leaving their classes with. And then they had a wonderful collegial discussion about where the gaps were. In, in that process. Um, it went well enough that the faculty in both groups want to do this again in the fall um, after they have some more information. So I have been tasked by the faculty with gathering some more data for them, uh, getting more information, um, and bringing them back together again next fall so that they can continue this process. Critical for us right now to be doing this, so um, the, other, the other item that I had on my, on my report for you tonight is the implementation of AB 705. Uh, which again, I mentioned briefly at the at the board meeting back in February. So this is legislation that technically went into place uh, went into play on the first of January of this year, which is aimed at um, changing and revising and reforming, if you will, the remedial education. Um, process at the California Community Colleges. And so AB 705 has a lot of mandates in it that our math and English faculty are going to need to look at. And the good thing is our math and English faculty are already on top of this, so the new law isn't going to mandate a whole lot that they're not already doing. But one of the critical things that they needed to start getting their heads around was um, how they were going to be utilizing grades and GPA from high school as one of the multiple measures of assessment for determining how students place in math and English when they come to our college. Uh, we do know that one, of the, that one of the greatest predictors of students succeeding in attaining their edu educational goal is the level that they reach when they enter here in math and English. The further they are below college level in their preparation when they come here, the less likely they are to ever complete a degree, a certificate, or transfer out to another school. So this is a critical issue that we in instruction feel is one of the most important things that we have on our plate right now is really addressing this. Because it's not just math and English, it's every discipline. Every discipline relies on, on the work that happens uh, uh, by their colleagues in those, in those uh, departments to really help bolster the entire academic uh, nature of the enterprise that, we're, that we engage in here. So it's a critical thing that affects everybody on campus, every instructor in every discipline. Um, and so we have a tremendous amount of respect and thanks for the work that our English and faculty members are doing in this. Um, so with, with, with this, uh, our faculty received fantastic new information from their counterparts in the high schools that gave them a clearer sense of what they can look at as they're looking at new multiple measures to put in place uh, that we need to have in place by fall of 2019. And so very productive meetings, wonderful to establish the connection between our faculty, but more importantly, they got very good actionable information between each other and discrete steps that they can take next to improve this. We're really, we're really wanting to, to um, em em embrace our, all of our educational partners in this system and really look at how we are collectively serving our students. Um, as they come here into the college because their success coming here is going to be directly reflective of their success leaving here. And so all of us have a stake in this and we've been um, really lucky this year to get a lot of support from the school districts in putting this together. Um, so that's the primary thing that I wanted to report out on from instruction. We've got lots of other stuff going on too, but this is kind of the big one over the last month. We are continuing with the implementation of AB 705. Uh, we do have our leadership group that is working jointly between academic affairs, student affairs, the Academic Senate for the adoption and implementation and um, investigation uh, in, into guided pathways. 
Uh, there is a, a multi-year plan that's due at the end of this month, and we have our lead leadership group getting together next week to go over the outline of that plan um, and to see what information we need to put in. We plan to bring something to the Board of Trustees uh, this year, a little information item either in one of my reports or as a separate information item, just to let you know what's going on with Guided Pathways, what it is, what it means, and why you're going to hear that name and that term a lot in the coming, in the coming years here at the college. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob? So very, I did not provide a written report tonight. I only have one thing to report because I think you'll be hearing enough of me later in the agenda. But uh, just to report that the Technology Committee under the leadership of our IT Director Eric Houck um, and the uh, faculty co-chair Josh Hansen continue to work on the technology plan. Uh, we've, they've gotten feedback from constituent groups are incorporating that feedback and we expect to bring the technology plan to you at the April 12th meeting. Good, thank you. Um, President's report, if you can bump that up. Um, wonderfully, um, much of this has been covered. Um, a, a couple of things that we, I could talk about. There's a lot of budget um, conversation in California, the governor's budget for sure. CEOs have convened um, a, uh, a funding formula, which hasn't been changed in many years. Um, I think at the beginning, the Chancellor's Office rolled out the funding formula changes and um, did not do a broad-based um, stakeholder group. So as you all know, uh, the, all colleges are different and we're all affected different. Um, so there is no one size fits all. And uh, we had um, robust discussions um, about this at the uh, CEO conference. And um, basically the, the key here is that the uh, the, the consensus is difficult. You can read this over, but there's broad agreement that it, the formula as it exists is not going to work. So they're going to slow it down, work it through, constituent the process. Um, the bottom line is to redistribute, get more dollars to the classroom. That That is a given. Um, everybody's into that and wants that to happen, so we're focused on that. Um, there is a letter um, that I put in here of... Um, Office of Emergency, and and basically tonight, um, you know, we've we've covered it. Manveer asked a great question in terms of um, I was going to ask um, Ken to unpack this a little bit, and you know, our we deeply thank um, our police academies for their presentation and our police department for, under Ken's leadership providing the kind of training that we need ongoing. We've done a, a, a good deal of training here. Um, no one is, as we've talked about, is prepared for this kind of an emergency when it happens. But you can anticipate the best you can and, and not be surprised by, by the event. So um, I think Ken did a good job kind of unpacking. Um, although you can feel free, if you'd like, Ken, to add the number of trainings that we're doing in terms of emergency, specifically shooter or active event, uh, or, or not. Yeah. I was going to call on you anyway. Okay. Yes. So do you want me Go to... Go ahead. Yes, please, if you can. So I, I, because I see uh, Trustee Martin I a has question, a question. So I, um, it would be easier if I actually get a chance to prepare some more stuff. I mean, there's... We'll come there back are, in. Yeah. The, there's a, just to give you an idea, though, we're as prepared as you can possibly be. We have, we... We do a lot of training. We, you know, we have intruder locks on all the classrooms. We we did that a number of years ago. We uh, put out as much information as we can. You can never put enough out. But more importantly, the two things that we do is we benefit as a college from our relationship with Napa County Sheriff's Department and the training they provide, which even by, as we had the FBI up here, even they were impressed with the training we receive. So, um we, a matter of fact, uh, we'll be up there. We shoot, uh, we go up and we train. It's not just it's movement to contact, but we do that every single month. Uh, just to, by way to give you an idea, most police agencies in the state of California shoot every three months. We shoot every month mm -hmm. and use firearms. And it's, it's always uh, movement to contact. And, and we, have a, uh, we have a very, very good relationship. The college has benefited greatly from that. And I feel very comfortable that my folks are, are, uh, aren't going to take up a position outside and wait. We, we don't do that. And we know we don't do that. 
Um, so I could prepare some more information, certainly on on that. And we don't train just for that. That's you know we, we're training earthquakes, shelters. Um, you know we we train for things to go wrong on a regular basis. And and I would add, and then I, yeah, I, I would add that from a board perspective, and why it's important, and I brought it up, is the the board policy establishes either a safety office or police department, and um, this college has had conversations over the years about whether or not we needed a police department. I, and I think the, the answer, at least during this season of life, is very clear that we feel safe, safer um, as we can be. So I commend you on all of that and um, the training that we do as well. I was, I was just wondering, one thing that hasn't been brought up um, as far as making the campus safer, is there any discussion about tinting the windows so people can see out but not see in because I noticed some of the employees are really exposed like for example the cashier as you approach the cashier window the, the windows aren't tinted and that person's in plain view um, I know they did that at the district um, all the schools the windows were were tinted in that way so I'm just wondering if there's any been kind of just not maybe all of them but the ones where employees are very are working and they're exposed I just think that maybe that could be looked at thank you we have, we are, and we have. But what we're looking at is instead of tinting, which obscures, is there's actually film that adds a layer of, of um, ballistic resistance. Oh. Um, so we've been looking at a little bit beyond obscuring is one thing. I'd rather provide you with with uh, you know a little more protection. So, right. but we have been addressing that, Matt. And I've already been looking at those things. Um, they. They would be not inexpensive, but we could d define strategic areas where we could could do that. Um, so that's a recent technology that that we just sort of discovered, and we've been looking at it. Is, is that a lot more expensive than tinting the windows so oh, yeah. that somebody can't yeah. see in? So tinting, well, yes. I mean, we have mixed feelings. Tint, if I can't see in, um, the difficulty is it depends on the lighting situation. You can't obscure it down to a point where I couldn't figure out that someone was in there what is safer to do for some critical areas is actually provide um, bullet resistance so if someone did shoot through the window the window won't collapse in other words it the bullet might go through it but the window is going to stay intact and give the person on the other side the ability to move where they may not have that um, if the window shatters um, so we'd have to look at it you know and, and and come up with some mechanism decide which one is is which Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to keep us kind of moving along, but and if there are more from the from the board, feel free. This is probably an item that will come up, and as horrible as it is, you know, it's a topic that we really need to address. Um, DACA and immigration. I have a, a couple comments on that. Um, recently, we had a um, a training here on campus, which I attended along with other folks to how to observe, and it was um, well attended, and and um, I thought. Um, very well put on and, and gave some kind of gu guidelines to both immigration and the DACA issues. Um, there are um, a bunch of people who are very excited about our open house happening on April 14th. Um, across the board, we have faculty, staff, and students um, doing a lot of things. So um, on, on your calendars, hopefully everybody is bringing, bringing a crew in. Um, I'm hiring a bus. I'm bringing in several hundred I'm just kidding. Um, I am bringing in my family from um, all, all sides, and um, they're excited about um, touring the campus as it, as it sits. Um, update on bond feasibility, just there will be, and we have an item tonight, and I wanted to make sure. There were a couple things that I really wanted to talk about. I wanted to thank uh, um, Trustee um, Santu for bringing in um, Alex Walker Griffin, who is the Student Board of Governor um, uh, appointee for for students and we had a nice chat um, the three of us and then he stayed a while and talked about Napa Valley College and um, it was it was really good to get a, a student from a statewide perspective I think he uh, agreed he felt that we were um, indeed the number one college in the state that was nice to hear um, from from him and I said you know if you remember we were twice named number one college but we're no longer there but he said well once you earn an Academy Award it's always yours and I said well that's a good thing <laughs> So um, with that, um, I would turn that over and thank you, and we can move along to minutes. Um, I'm so sorry. Yes, uh, we have one more. Um, Doug, 
I'm sorry. Um, we have the, uh, um, and I think I skipped it actually, but the public information officer, and that's 10.3, I'm sorry. And I have one more item, yeah. Thank you. Got ahead of myself, yeah. I was. There we go, right there. You know, KGO came and interviewed Ken. I'm sorry, Doug Ernst, public information officer. KGO came and interviewed Ken about uh, what we're doing. And it was a great report. If you want to get it, uh, look at it. Uh, there's a link on that story. And uh, I was proud of you. Mm -hmm. My mother was too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, the, it's a standard report. But uh, the other thing is I have an addendum this week. And it's. Um, Something that Cynthia is going to help me with. Uh, yes, there's something that's it's too high up there. I can't see the tabs. <laughs> and it goes to what uh, Dr. Kraft was talking about with the open house. Uh, you know, the register ran the story. It was uh, extensive and complete, but the, the event is still growing. We're bringing in additional events, and with every additional event, we're going to have a, a new press release. Um, what I'm here to ask is for each trustee to... to Tell your friends, you know, try to come, tell your friends, your relatives, the neighbor down the street, uh, anybody at all, because um, I think once people get here, they're really going to have a good time, and they're going to really learn a lot about the college. It's getting them here that's the problem. You know, it is a Saturday in spring, and so it takes a monumental effort to make this really appealing. Uh, so we're, we're counting on your help. Um, also, you know, the, the fact is the staff is really working hard on this. We had a committee a couple days ago. Scott Allen ran it, um, 20 people showed up in the classified lounge and everybody's involved and, and enthusiastic. And it'd be great to show um, the community how, how committed your staff is. And uh, some of that commitment uh, could be shown by you as trustees. So I'm encouraging you to do that. Doug? Yeah. So last week I came to you and got copies of the flyer and it was a great success. I went to a crab feed in American Canyon with about 500 people and went to every single table with those flyers. Mm -hmm. um, and people were really excited about it, and especially in American Canyon because it's mostly families with young, young kids. And uh, they were just thrilled to hear about this event that was kid-friendly. I think we could easily get 1,000 people here. Uh, Scott Allen thinks 5,000. I think he's been smoking something. But, <laughs> but you know, that's a good bracket. And if, if, we, can get, uh, if we can get support from our own community, mm -hmm. it's going to be more successful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I, I do have one thing. I, um, as you know, our um, executive coordinator has been out um, this week, so I, I missed one item I wanted to put on the president's report, and that was this kind of audiovisual summary steps for the board um, uh, in terms of capturing and stuff and we'd asked for this and and I've got and I will add this back in for the public it's not it'll be an amendment that I'll publish right away probably tonight before I leave um, or Carolee might do that before she leaves um, there are um, there are certain steps to go on and I just kind of wanted to walk the board through these so we've been working on these in terms of trying to get it um, wired in so an audio recording is made and streamed live as we speak right now on Napa Broadcasting and that's posted on and available on board docs with a link and on Napa Broadcasting site and um, it's also posted following each board meeting um, by the Monday following. So Monday that will be posted up with a timestamp on it. Um, a video, as you all see up there, um, is captured along with an audio portion right now as I'm speaking. As I'm speaking at this moment, um, the National Captioning Service is writing this out. Um, so, um, and this, it's kind of real time. That video and audio transcriptions are then sent to Napa Broadcasting those transcriptions are received and then closed caption included with the video. Um, and those generally go out within seven to 10 days is our goal. Um, and time stamps and posting a video with closed caption um, is available on board docs and YouTube. So that's kind of the whole sequence of stuff. We're still figuring out there are 
different solutions. We've gone out to many different um, um, school districts. Some pay enormous sums for this. Ours is very reasonable, and um, we're trying to kind of feel our way as we go. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we might do in the future is, you know, a year or so, whatever it might be, is right now we have a kind of a fisheye video which shows the entire panel as we speak, um, and we may consider, you know, improvements to that over the years. Um, but um, we're not a big multi-college district, which assigns a, a employee to, to do all of those things, and they um, can be very expensive in terms of time and materials. So that's the, that's the update. I will post this. Um, following the meeting, if not tonight, then tomorrow for sure. Yes. So, so this was, I asked this to be on the agenda and I didn't know it was going to be talked about tonight. So um, is this going to still be on the agenda or is this my time to ask questions about this? Because I had asked for this to be on the agenda because I had some well, questions. You could go, I don't know, ask questions and okay. we can answer if we can. If we can't, then yeah. we'll see what we can do. So I'm just wondering. And we have so Jeff um, Shackman here who might be able to answer questions as well. So originally when the board made the decision, but this is before video, when we made the decision to have the audio recording, this was outside of the contract with Napper Broadcasting and we had agreed to pay $200 a month for that service. So I'm wondering wondering now, are we continuing to pay $200 a month, or did that go away, and now this is part of his regular contract that he provides this service in exchange for being able to use that facility at a discounted rate? Yeah, I can answer that. And um, Jeff, you can help me if I am do this wrong, or Carol Lee, who um, coordinates the contract itself. So um, the standard fee for the live streaming and all of that is the same. That's 200 right now, and that's the audio of which people are listening to at the moment. Um, the National Captioning Service, the one who's transcribing that right now, is a different um, firm, and they are an hourly charge. And we're yet working on the second part. This is a little bit of an experiment, and, um, but somewhere between, and I, and I don't want to step on this, somewhere with, for a, a few hundred, whatever it might be, we're doing the second half of this transcription and the time stamping piece. Right. Just to make a long, complicated process as short as possible. First of all, video in general tends to be a little glitchy. In fact, we the past two months, there have been little problems with the video. There was the possibility of a corrupted file. It all got worked out. Cynthia did some magic, and uh, she still hasn't told me exactly what the magic spell was, but it worked. In any case, because video is glitchy, we're still doing the audio, because otherwise there is no backup. So it's worth having the audio as the backup. Once the video is done, the video has to be edited down. Then it has to be merged with the file that is created from the, trans from the captioning transcript. Those two things are merged into YouTube. The trick with that, which we're just feeling our way through, is really finding the timing. When we first merged it together, and this was the very first time, the last meeting was the first time, it was off by about four minutes after playing with it, talking to their tech support people back and forth. We got it down to about three seconds, and I finally decided three seconds is the best we're going to do for the first time. We'll be able to get it exact the next time. So it's a pro the, the bottom line is it's a process. The audio is the backup. The video is, is something we're experimenting with and adding the closed captioning to it and then timing it out so that it syncs up with the agenda in board docs. Thank you. And I, th I think it's coming along. So right now you would typify our, our video as a bit of a foreign film. Right, with a little delay. A little, um, tiny little of, yeah. delay. Yes. Now, the, the thing about it is that because, it, as you said, it's the one camera that, that yeah. is on the whole panel, yeah. it's very hard to tell who's talking anyway. Right. So it, it, it's of less significance than if they were close up so we saw somebody specifically speaking. Good. So our intent here is to continue to improve the process, make sure that the public can adequately see what's going on, get informed of what's going on, and then we meet all our criteria for closed captioning, which is important as well. Um, so we're kind of moving through this. There, right. there is no having the appropriate one. backup and coordinating the process. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Okay. So the, yeah. So this goes beyond just a report. So I'm still going to ask stuff on the agenda. But yeah, go ahead. But to bring up the video, um, one thing I noticed that, um, is that the video recordings are coming up like right before the next meeting. So like almost a whole month is going by. Is 
So people have to wait like a month to watch the video for our board meeting. So I think that was between, that was us trying to get the transcript service and that it should not in the future, including this meeting, we should be on this 10 day okay. issue now. So I okay. would think that, the, we, I would expect from a 10 days from now that it should be. So um, we had to, as you know, um, right, research firms that would do this, check out the firms, their credibility, some were, you know, so hopefully it, it's working along and it will get better. Thank you. Okay. Just real quickly in terms of the captioning, because it's interesting, and I'll take an extra minute here. This company that does it, um, National Captioning Institute, it's called, actually, they do most of the television networks, the live time, closed captioning, um, and, and what's really interesting, their corporate offices in Southern California, their, their tech support people that we call are in Dallas, Texas, and the people that are actually doing the transcribing are all over the place. So it's somebody, you know, in their home or in an office somewhere else doing this. So it's a fascinating process. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Um, codify my notes, make sure they get into a, a brief report. Thank you. So that's, that is now, I believe, the end of my report. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now we'll go on to approving the minutes. Uh, if there are no objections, I think everything is good for February 8th minutes. Mm -hmm. Minutes approved? Yeah. With no objection. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we'll move on to the minutes from January 18th. We did approve those minutes, uh, but there was, a, there was some language found missing. That is a motion by Amy Martinson to approve the presence of an attorney at board meetings on a trial basis of three months, and it was seconded by Manveer Sandhu. So we would like to reapprove those minutes uh, with that uh, addition. And if I, if there are no objections, those minutes are approved. Okay, great. We will move on, and we'll move on to item number 12.1, bond feasibility update on engagement, and I believe we have uh, a speaker on that item. 12.1, Leo Browning and Gary Orton, and it looks like Mr. Orton is up first. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Gary Orton, I live in Napa. Um, I just want to make an observation. I'm trying to be helpful. I have been on your side of the table in a similar situation. When I first got on the Belmont City Council in 1985, I was presented with this catastrophe with our storm drainage system. Basically, it was a defunct storm drainage system, but it broke, and we had to go out and ask the voters for some money to repair it. They were angry. Um, so we had to be very, very clear in our message as to we're not spending more money than we have to. We're doing only what's necessary, and we won't come back to you again for more money. So that message had to get out, and it had to get out very consistently. Um, I, I read this. I've been reading the materials and the rationale for the proposed bonds, and I get it that the district needs money to repair its facilities What's not clear is why they need repairing. Uh, why were they not repaired on a continuing basis? And I understand that might not be your guys, you know, might not have happened on your watch, but it happened on somebody's watch. And what the voters out there wanna know is, have you taken care of the problem why they weren't being repaired on a continuing basis? Or maybe it's not for repairs, but the, the literature, the things I'm reading, it seems to be about repairing things. <clears throat> So when we had this storm drainage problem, we wanted to make sure that when it came to our streets, we weren't gonna to have to go ask people for money to repair the streets. So we were one of the first cities to adopt the pavement management system created by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So you assess your streets, you figure out which are the worst, make sure they get done so that you know, you're know you spending the least amount of money, but you're spending it every year, you make sure you spend it. And we got angry with our city engineer when he didn't repair streets, because he was supposed to be repairing streets on a regular basis. So that was our oversight responsibility when it came budget time. Have you been doing your pavement management? Yes, okay. So, we'd, so we wouldn't have to go back to the voters. It's creating trust with the community that you're handling the money properly. So again, the message isn't clear to me that this isn't gonna happen again. The message isn't clear that you have a policy of deferred maintenance. Deferring maintenance, 
for 20 years and then going back to the voters every 20 years to ask for a big bond issue to repair the things they should have been repaired all along. It's not clear to me. If you're not doing that, that's fine, but the message, your message has to be clear that you've taken care of the problem and it's not gonna happen again. So I'm just passing that along as an observation and you can get in trouble with the public if they figure this stuff out or if you're not being clear. I'm just trying to be helpful. And Ron and I had this conversation December of 2016. So in addition to making a clear message, we got together a whole bunch of members of the community to help put together the plan for the storm drainage system so that the word got out that they were also involved in helping make these decisions and knowing we weren't spending money we didn't need to be spending money on. Again, trying to be helpful and not criticizing. It's just going to bite you back if you don't watch it. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Next, we have Leo Browning. I'm sorry, I think I said Leo instead of Leon. Well, thank you, Mr. Orton. <laughs> I was going to talk about clarity also, because I'm confused. And it's kind of amazing, because I think I'm one of the most knowledgeable people about school bonds in this community. I've been the past vice president of CalBOC, the statewide group that helps oversight committees understand what they're doing. I've supported your Measure N bond. I supported the school district Y, M and G bonds. I've been on oversight committees for M and G on uh, Measure A, the flood control. I'm on the Measure H oversight committee now. I've seen the problems from the oversight committee um, view. What I see is when there's confusion and lack of clarity prior to the, uh, establishing the bond, it magnifies in oversight. And it actually ends up that there becomes no oversight. First of all, the o Prop 39 rules for oversight are so loose, and they give the school district or the college the duty to select the oversight members, which means they're going to select their own cheerleaders. So basically, oversight committees are not going to get in trouble with their district um, trustees. So I've been confused about uh, this new bond. And the confusion is a problem. You have been working on it for 10 months since last May, and you don't have a project list for your bond. You don't have costs. You really don't know what you're doing. You're still asking people in the community what they want. You got this um, community feedback form. It says, would you like us to repair and upgrade job planning, uh, training classrooms, update and modernize science labs, update classrooms, educational facilities to meet current building facilities? Do you know where that language came from? It came from Measure N. You are asking the community to do the same work that was proposed and completed, according to Dr. Kraft, in Measure N. And I say that about Dr. Kraft because last month, Ms. Baker asked him, were all the projects of Measure N completed? And Dr. Kraft said, yes, it's right on the, uh, the website. So, question is why would you ask to repair or renovate or rebuild these classrooms again and on your website it says that all the measure N work was completed in 2013 five years ago why would you ask this community to pay again ask the taxpayers to pay again to replace or repair classrooms that you did five years ago it makes no sense and it confuses the, the, the community, it confuses me. The polling questions that you asked in Godby are the same thing. Do you want to have classrooms repaired? Well, sure they do, but why weren't they? You said they were. Why were they not repaired? The, the taxpayers are paying until the year 2034 for all that work, but you're saying you want them to do it again. It just makes no sense. 
So I would like to see a firm plan. Do you know one year ago today you approved your facilities master plan? And according to that, there was, there was a uh, Napa Valley Register article on the 13th of March last year, and it says that your facilities market plan, uh, master plan was approved by the community, by constituencies within the college. So you have a plan. Why are you still asking people, asking the community to give you feedback on what you're going to do? You have four months when you, until you have to make a decision to go for the November bond. You're not ready. And the community sees this. The Napa Valley Register was negative about your 2014 Measure E because you weren't prepared. You're not prepared again. Thank you. There are no other comments are on we? this topic. Yeah, I so think Bob and I the... do come over here and we'll have to. Yes. And thank you, both speakers. We'll try to get at any specific questions as specific as we can as we work our way through. And I appreciate all of the, the updates. Tonight is a continuation of the, um, the conversation that we've been having in terms of um, keeping, keeping the bond feasibility kind of front and center, and that was the board's direction about a year and a half ago to make sure that um, we were providing uh, as much input as we possibly could. Um, Bob and I are going to just update a cup. Oh, it's kind of creeps, isn't it? Um, that's okay. It's a, it's a power. Oh, it's a power. Ah, I got it. Okay, so not to not to uh, review that. This was part of the. This is a. There are additional PowerPoint slides tonight. This is the one that we saw last time. Basically talked about the history of facilities a bit. I don't need to go through this too much. We did this um, the fall campus um, feedback survey. What we did learn from the 14 survey specifically, and we've talked about it here before, um, and the God B research piece that was the post um, measure in, am I saying that correct? Uh, you know, post measure in, was basically to define, define, define. Um, and one e, of the key points, e. E? E, yeah. e, thank you, sorry, measure E. Um, define as, as close as we could. So what we have done is engage broadly and deeply the college constituencies um, all of the senates who are here tonight and who are not here tonight, um, many other um, constituencies around campus. Try to get as specific as we can addressing the question that was really open in 14. Um, you know, are you specific enough? Does the, does the community understand the relationship of the college to the community? What, do you need these items? Those. And, and that's really what we have done in terms of the taking our time this time to unpack it a little bit. We had campus forums, um, a survey of students, faculty, and administrators. Um, we, we did these, um, this was the, the comments that we shared last time with you in terms of, of responses. We had um, survey responses we shared last time that we went over last time. We also talked about our campus engagement process. We had a, a web page. We had nine, are these yours, Bob, right here? Yes. Yep. Um, and Bob might talk about these. Um, uh, FMP refinement affinity group pieces you want to just address certainly so looking at the facilities master plan there were some specific buildings that were called out and so there have been meetings that have taken place for example for the new science lab building with the science faculty involving an architect to get a clear picture of what needs to be in that building the number of labs the support spaces meetings with student affairs faculty on what needs to be in the enhanced um, student center uh, what uh, needs to be in the VWT classroom building to enhance and improve the ability to, live, to deliver those services. And so those meetings had taken place, but there are many other buildings on campus that would be touched by uh, upgrades and improvements. And so we invited the campus community to come in. We had nine forums here at the main Napa campus, one forum which ju just took place on Tuesday of this week at the Upper Valley campus, to invite people to come in and give us feedback. We got feedback from the survey 
and there were comments that were included in the survey, and so we wanted to have a conversation about those comments. When you say that technology needs to be improved, what do you mean by that? When you say that you would are looking for upgrades uh, to classrooms in buildings, what does that mean? And so got some great feedback from these forums that we had, we're compiling those results, and we'll be going back out to those constituent groups, to division meetings, to the senates, um, to bring closure to that discussion as to what will happen in each of the buildings and what those improvements will be. I think too. I think too. Responding to to some of the language that you've you've the, some of the questions you've asked and some of the speakers that we've heard. In, in terms of this engagement on campus and the FMP, we're really talking about significant changes in classrooms, updating, um, as, as we said, Measure N was um, 2002, um, correct, am I good on that, 2002? Um, you know, so much of technology has really changed. Um, so many of the parameters for even lab spaces have changed. And, and so m many of these forums are trying to zero in on affinity groups to say, you know, what does a faculty office now look like? What does a success center look like now? And moving in, or what should it look like in the future? Um, and w we haven't focused so much in, on these forums, on our scheduled maintenance, which we can talk about tonight. The board's going to see a couple things on scheduled maintenance, um, the re-roofing, and last time we, we did re-roofing. So it is included. We are taking care of what we have. Um, the, the difficulty is that in some of the big repair issues, um, it's not built into the budget um, for, on an ongoing basis. Am I saying that correctly? You want to sure. add to that? Sure, so we do continue to maintain the facilities through scheduled maintenance money, but I'll use one thing that came up through the uh, meetings that we had, and we specifically scheduled these meetings in the 800 building, the 1400 building, the 1200 building, the 1600 building. So the buildings that would be improved um, and, and, and would be enhanced through any potential bond measure. And for example, the 1600 building, if you've ever been in the 1600 building, those classrooms are separated by wooden movable walls. Now it's quite possible that those walls haven't been opened in about 25 or 30 years. Um, and do they function? They absolutely function. Do they separate the spaces? Yes, they do. Are they the best way to utilize that space? Probably not. So it goes back to, are we maintaining that space? We absolutely are. But could we enhance that space and make a better learning environment for our students? And the answer is yes, we could. And so that's the feedback that we were looking for uh, by hosting these forums. And I would address, fair question. I mean, did, you know, in, the, in, in earlier, and I'm responding to this, I think it's a good question, you know, in, in the last bond, were classrooms improved? And yes, they were. Um, we have, you know, new science classrooms, many new classrooms in the LRC and library that are used, um, you, you know, we've all been there. New classrooms in um, the arts and humanities and upgrades in, in many of those buildings. So much was done um, during the last bond, and there's m more to do. Um, you just um, simply have to ad address the fact that um, it's, um, it's not a, a, a as, as Gary's example, it's, it's a good example, Mr. Orton, I'm sorry, um, it's a good example um, in terms of having a single problem that's really identifiable, but what I do like about that is providing clarity um, about the need. So I think what we're discovering here as we, as we go to our next steps, and I'll, I'll get that real fast here, is the uh, community engagement piece. What we're really trying to do is understand, A, at the beginning of this now, um, what community members feel. Um, th this is um, a document and a survey that's starting to come in. I think I talked to Carolee last time, and I think we had a, a, a thousand out. Okay, I'm sorry, about 15,000 out. We're getting responses, it will be continuing, and it helps shape um, the community's perception um, and of, of what we, it helps shape our perception of what the community wants. And the information mailer will come in in March, 
Um, we're going to be doing more listening sessions where everybody is um, available, including in those listening sessions uh, undoubtedly will be the oversight committees. Um, we will have an oversight committee. There will be a taxpayer person if we move forward on this, um, representing, um, you know, by, um, by law, um, you know, that, um, that constituency. And we'll follow up with this um, um, more research that as, um, as is needed. The next steps really here, um, I'm trying to get to the, um, is there another one past this, Carol Lee? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, ongoing engagements with facilities. Um, we are planning on at the April meeting, your next meeting, um, bringing in a, a, a very sharp document that outlines um, each of the proposed improvements in a, uh, I think, I'm hoping, a very clear, precise manner. So if you're gonna build this building or improve this building, what's that look like? Why do we need it? And how is it gonna benefit student success? Fair enough. Um, we're also in the process, um, we don't wanna go to construction estimates in April because it's still too much input. Um, but we will have construction estimates on all of those pieces at the May meeting. And, and, we, and we on track? Yeah, yes. at the May meeting. So at, uh, four weeks from now, we should have a, a good, sharp document um, that's based in the educational master plan, then followed up with the facilities master plan, and then if you, if you, if you will, a strong you know, potential bond project list, which the board then can then ask questions or the community can ask questions. Um, you know, why do you need this? Should this happen? Should it be smaller, bigger? Um, I was on one uh, uh, bond measure in San Diego County where we talked about, um, um, pa we passed the measure and all of the high schools in that bond measure had to take a 10% cut, which and across the board, everything got 10% smaller. What they failed to recognize with a football field, if it's 10% smaller, um, is only 90 yards. So we had to kind of come back to the board. Um, so, you, you know, not, I guess my point is not everything can be fixed with just a, a very easy fix. So we'll, we'll dive in, we'll take a look um, and kind of move forward. Um, the board action tentative will be considered the adoption of the, prog uh, of the, of the bond list once you feel uh, comfortable with that. Estimates and then a resolution and we'll see, uh, we'll see where we go. Um, a, lot, a lot more information coming your way and a lot more discussion with the community. As you know, the Speakers Bureau, myself, and um, uh, I think in 14, there were many meetings, but I think it was just Mr. Browning and myself um, at, at these meetings. Now, there, I think there's great interest in the community and we we're expecting and, and seeing a lot more interest in, in the um, speaking engagements. So, questions? Yes, I have a, a question, if I may. Would the the list of um, capital outlay construction plan that we submitted and approved last June, that's a requisite submission by the district to the state of California, would that somewhat mirror uh, what a potential bond might look like as far as number one as an example list, machine tool welding modernization, two is 200 classrooms, uh, three is 2200 building physics and science, physical sciences, Four is uh, 900 building student services. Five is classroom modernization, uh, building 1600, building 1400 is classroom modernization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Would that somewhat mirror what we approved last June as it, far as? It will further define what you approved last year, but it does definitely reflect what you approved last year and what you'll be approving again in June of this year is that master list that we submit to the state every year, but that was based on the facilities master plan that was approved last year by the board, and nothing has changed, um, but there will be much more detail than you see in the uh, five-year capital plan that we submit to the state every year. Thank you. And, and I would uh, add, Michael, that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a state document, you know, it's not very user friendly, if you will, and, not, and, and definitely not as definitive as we'd like to be. So it's, it's a great beginning, but it's not what we need and what we're hearing. Other questions? Trustee Martinson. I just have, yeah, one question, I have two comments. Um, so question, so it sounds like 
uh, the student success centers back in because I guess it wasn't listed as the five things that people could rank, but it came up a lot in the comments. So that's still part of the discussion, the student success center. Um, success center is a part of the educational master plan, but also, so I think we're saying the same thing, but success centers to help um, mentor, teach. Um, Eric, what are we? Isn't it the student success, like where all the student services would be in one building? Oh, that's different. Yeah. But yeah, ac academic support and student support services is what you're right. referring yeah. to, which is inclusive of student success centers specifically. I just want to make sure that that's still, because again, it wasn't listed that people could rank from, but mm -hmm. I remember. Remember um, that was a, a point of contention um, in 2014 among the students that that had been promised with Measure N and never happened. So I just wanted to make sure that was still on the table as far as uh, being part of the p potential bond. Yeah, it's definitely on the table, and, and it's um, in um, in one of the and I'm sure in several affinity groups meetings we've talked about um, what that might be, how it would how it would address student needs, etc. Okay, and yeah. then just two comments. Um, I brought this up when we approved the facilities master plan, and I'm only bringing up it again because I remember at one point um, Mr. Parker said that that plan is a living document, um, and I think this will become an issue with a potential bond because it was an issue in 2014, and it's still an issue, and that is that um, it, there were when we approved the facilities master plan, it, in that document it talked about how there were certain buildings that were so outdated that it would be the same cost to tear down and rebuild versus renovate. Um, but yet in the, the plan, the plan was to keep them and to build more buildings. And I'd asked um, about that because I think one of the concern and accreditation brought this up and it came up with the last bond, and again, I think it'll come up again, is that our enrollment is declining. So why are we increasing the footprint of the campus? And it goes back to the maintenance issue as well, that it's just more to maintain. Um, and we have an issue with maintenance when we build these additional buildings. So I guess what I'm wondering, I just think politically, um, I think it would be a lot easier to sell a bond that didn't increase the footprint of the campus. And so I'm wondering if that is still an option. Yes, and so let me just say that even if you look at it, when you see the final um, list that we'll be bringing in April, it doesn't reflect a significant increase in square footage. So for example, if we build the 200 building, which is a general purpose or large format classroom space, that takes the place of the 2200 buildings, which are the um, relocatable, portable bungalows, whatever term we might like to use for that. Um, and so no real net gain in square footage um, uh, with that classroom space. We are building or, or contemplating building a new science lab building. So to replace the activities that take place in the 1800 building. The reason that we're doing that is that if we renovated the 1800 building, we'd actually end up with one less lab space than we currently have in the 1800 building. And so what we need, what we do need is additional physical sciences lab space um, to support our STEM activities, our STEM program. So that would be a new building that would replace the activity that takes place in the 1800 building. We will, however, keep the 1800 building because it's a good solid facility. And one thing that we learned with the 2014 earthquake, well, you learned, I wasn't here, but what the college learned with the 2014 earthquake is that these buildings are structurally, structurally solid and very sound. And so we would be looking to renovate that building. But really what we'd be doing is looking to move the Mesa program up to the first floor and repurpose the basement of that building for its original purpose, which was really storage space and uh, simulation space. Um, as we look at the construction of the 200 building, we're looking to bring the simulation center down from the Yontville Veterans Home and down to the main campus to better support our students and provide better activity um, or access to those activities to our students. So I'm sorry, that's a very long way of saying that we're really not looking at increasing, significantly increasing square footage on campus as a result of, of uh, this uh, potential list. I have a question. And 
I guess I have two questions. So my first question is, I think that we are uh, going to be getting consensus from the constituent groups, and that will be presented to the board, is that correct? So we'll be able to say, you know, Academic Senate says this. Yes, you will. I mean, I, I'm meeting with all the Senates and other constituent groups um, to address their feelings on, on a, a potential bond, and, um, and we'll, we'll see. Um, you, know, it, 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 you, you know, we don't want to, I'm certainly not going to um, promise the board or anybody else, um, you know, how constituencies might weigh in on it, but um, that's part of this process that we're taking a long, long view, a lot of buy-in. If, if it's a kind of an if-then, Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, do, are you supporting the notion of of um, this improvement to the spaces through the through the facilities master plan is is more the question if the if if um, the endorsement of, of a potential bond um, is a, is a piece of that um, I'm hoping that that might be uh, um, just for the clarity for you all um, mm -hmm. so. Um, we expect faculty, staff, and students to weigh in, and we re we report that back to you and the administrators as well. So we don't. Uh, so do we expect that the academic senate would uh, take a vote and say, give us the, what the final is on that vote, or how would that? Amanda you want to address it, Amanda, or you? Yeah, please. Um, when so in late February. Uh, Ron and Bob made a presentation to the Senate, sort of actually laying out much of what we're seeing here. And if I'm not mistaken, the tentative plan was a vote, up and down vote in May. Okay. In the Senate. Okay. Okay, great. And then um, also there are, in answer to repairs and simply repairs, there are, though, some repairs or enhancements, as you mentioned, that will bring in uh, the ability to have more students enroll in certain areas. Isn't that correct? That's right. I mean, the one of the contemplated pieces, and and we're and we're kind of trying to coordinate this activity with the Napa Valley College Foundation. Um, is to increase the capacity for students in the wine program, VWT, as an example. Um, right now, those classes are kind of standing room only in the evenings in, a, in that small bungalow, if you will, and um, a, a sensory classroom that um, is kind of uh, equal to the stature of what's required in the valley in terms of training is one of the things that we're kind of leaning towards, and that would be um, I would expect, th this is my expectation, I mean, as president, when you say stuff, you know, there it is, but I would expect that our enrollment capacity would increase in those programs um, because right now it's, it's um, difficult to get a spot, it's difficult to um, fight your way into those classes, and we've had trustees um, on this board who have attended those, and um, uh, Michael, and um, there are, um, and, and, and uh, so that's a good example. Okay. Uh, does anybody, Manfair? On the topic of taking input, at our open house on, in April, will there be a booth for the community to give more input on what they think we should do with the bond, since there'll be up 1,000 to up to 5,000 people there? Yeah, um, yeah we, I mean, really what we have to do, and everybody's aware, especially community and, and our speakers, I mean, we can't, as a college, we have to be very um, cautious. We can't campaign for a bond or encourage, you know, vote for a bond, but we certainly can have, we'll have materials there on enrollment, we'll have materials there on all of our programs, and, and we'll invite people to, um, we'll probably have that link up. I haven't talked with Carol Lee on this, but. Um, okay, informational signage that would indicate where the um, survey, you could take the survey and weigh in. That, that's perfectly appropriate and okay. Thank you. Can I follow up just briefly? Yes, yes. So will we have a survey available to take for people at the event, or is that still up in the air? It's camp. You mean a paper, paper pencil survey? Well, since we already emailed it out, mm -hmm. I don't see why we couldn't yeah. 
have it there in person. We, we could, we could. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Is there any? I had a, just a question. So obviously I understand what grounds are, but with athletics, what's the difference between the field, gymnasium, tennis courts, all that area? Like I was looking at the comments. We got three comments for athletics. Mm -hmm. Is that just the soccer fields or the outside track? It, it's really all of those things. And so the, um, the facilities master plan that, that you approved uh, contemplates, and what we're looking at for our list, contemplates improvements to the first floor of the 600 building where the gym is located. There were no improvements made to that. The last bond improved the upper floor where the gymnasium itself is, but improvements to the lower floors, so the locker rooms, the training room, uh, the racquetball courts, those areas that are on the first floor, it also incorporates all of the fields. So um, improvements to all of the fields that exist behind the uh, gymnasium. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to weigh in. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? No? Okay, one last question. Yeah, one last, um, yeah, it's more of a comment. Um, so only other kind of concern I had was the timeline. So it says tentative board action July, August which is basically what it was in 2014. The board made the decision at the end of July, and we all agreed that was too late to launch an effective campaign for something like this. So I just had a question how we got back on that timeline that it would be July or August. So the board would make a decision, and that's when it would start raising money and campaigning to pass a bond. Can that would I, be an external I? group, uh, you know, um, outside of the outside of the college and and it, friends of the college, if you will. Um, I, I would expect that they would, l looking at the timeline. I haven't had any conversations at all along this line yet, but looking at the timeline, establish. I, I'd be very surprised if they didn't establish a friends of Napa College very soon, and start, um, um, you know, testing the waters to see how the community might. So you're talking know, about the independent foundation doing that. Not our foundation. It, this would be a, like a, pack. a separate pack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I can say, I'd like to add what I think is the difference mm -hmm. in, in that the timeline the last time, um, everything began at that point um, where so much has been happening for the past, what, 10? Year and two, a half. Year and a half, 12 yeah. months. Um, that wasn't happening before. So it was like that was the go point when we were really behind the eight ball, um, as opposed to this time around, there's so much happening leading up to it that by the time the board uh, passes that resolution to either go or not go, uh, a, a whole lot of data, a whole lot of planning, project list, constituent groups weighing in, all of those things won't be at the go point. They will have already taken place. But you can't really launch a campaign until the board makes a decision to put the bond on the ballot. So I guess, anyway, I just, just yeah. throwing measure, that out there. Measure in the resolution happened the same time frame um, in uh, July, uh, the first one in 2002. Um, so it's, it's a very n normal kind of piece um, for a board to establish a resolution maybe s six months before four or seven months before, either, either A, they've been really researching and they're, and they're sure of um, the community support, um, or um, I don't know, maybe a multi-college district. I haven't heard of one who would, who would go out that early. But this is, so vote ballots go out in October, so this is two months before. So anyway, I just think it's not enough time in my opinion, but. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. We'll move on to 12.2, an update on campus housing. And I do have a speaker card for Mr. Orton on this topic. Good 
Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, my name is Gary Orton, I reside in Napa. Um, let me hand this to... <clears throat> the California Government Code specifically prohibits the Board of Trustees from exempting the College District from local zoning ordinance when the proposed use of the property is for non-classroom facilities. So the discussion just had about moving one building or creating another building and all that, those had to do with classrooms. Otherwise, you know, you can exempt yourself from this, the city uh, conditional use permit process. You can do that by a two-thirds vote. But when it comes to non-classrooms, you must go, the, the district must go and get a conditional use permit regarding housing on campus. Uh, the city of Napa zoning ordinance requires a conditional use permit. Um, it has, and my question is, has the college begun coordinating with the city of Napa in the planning for housing and other non-classroom facilities? <clears throat> Not only does the city have vastly more land use planning experience, it undoubtedly has specific concerns within its purview, such as impacts on traffic circulation and public safety. If the college has not been coordinating its planning efforts with the city, when will it begin? So that's my first question. <clears throat> my second question is, will there be a site-specific evaluation of the hazards due to sea level rise over the full projected life of any proposed development? Such concerns are, ad are addressed in the sea level rise policy guidance document adopted by the Coastal Commission in 2015. The guidance provides an overview of the best available science on sea level rise for California and recommends a methodology for addressing sea level rise in planning and regulatory actions. Undoubtedly, the city of Napa has followed this new regulatory framework. Attached is a map of, of the Pacific Institute cited in the Coastal Commission policy guidance showing the projected sea level rise for Napa. Notice that the athletic fields and the undeveloped property extending directly north of those fields to Amola are shown on the map as being subject to hazard from sea level rise. So that's my, so my, that's my second question. Will there be a site-specific evaluation? My third question is, will, who will be the lead agency for the preparation of an environmental impact report, the city of Napa or the college? That's probably subject to negotiation between the uh, city and probably the city of Wona be the lead agency. That's my hunch. <clears throat> Fourth question is, how will the cost of the EIR, EIR and any required mitigation, whether to lessen environmental impacts identified in the EIR or to avoid sea level rise risks, affect the affordability of proposed housing? If preliminary estimates of these costs have not been made, when will such estimates be made in order to get a complete picture of the project's feasibility? So I think you need, and I believe at some point they're going to have a feasibility. I think uh, Mr. Parker indicated in uh, one of the meetings that the phase one would be uh, feasibility. And that's usually a feasibility, kind of a rough estimate. It gets more refined as you go along, but you have to know whether you even want to go along with the project. I mean, there's lots of costs that are going to be involved if you can do this project, but I'm also pointing out in my four questions here that there's a lot of coordination and there's going to be some real heavy costs with regard to an EIR. Thank you very much. Thank you. So 12.2 um, is really a, not a presentation of any kind, but just a request for consideration for the rest of the board. Um, as we know that we had the Balfour Beatty presentation um, and then we had fires. Uh, and, and I think that We'd like to keep this, I think we would all like to keep this ball moving, keep it rolling, but um, I think what may be a consideration for us is bringing back and having presentations from the other finalists that we also uh, considered who were, uh, one of them was a local smaller company and we can do this over the next couple of months. Maybe in um, April, we bring back the local company, and, uh, and then in May, we bring back the other company for a presentation, and really, and then I actually, um, at a convention, a convention that I was at um, two weeks ago, 
it's been two weeks now, Mayor. Um, met someone who is a uh, professor at Saddleback College in architecture, and he had some really great information that um, I'd like to also bring forward. So I think that more information, the more information we can bring to this discussion, I think would be beneficial. So what conversation thoughts would we like to, Raphael? Well, I had, I guess maybe it's a concern or, or maybe I need more information. I was under the impression that we've gone through the initial process for this, that most of this process is really not our, in, within our purview as the board, that it's within Dr. Crafts and, and his staff to evaluate those uh, proposals that were submitted mm -hmm. and that that was actually done and Balfour Beatty was brought forward as the most qualified at that point. So I don't understand and I think to me it seems a problem to go back and reopen those that initial portion of this consideration when it looks like we, we had our recommendation from the staff. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that uh, potentially new information, uh, feedback that may want us to reconsider, um, and that's why I'm bringing this forward. So, uh, Trustee Martinson. I agree with um, Trustee Rios. I, I mean, obviously, maybe something's going on that we're not aware of, but I, I don't. I think that if there's an issue with Balfour Beatty, then the, then that's something that the president deals with his staff as far as maybe they need to update us. Um, I thought this was going to be an update, uh, so I thought we were going to hear from Dr. Kraft or Dr. P or Mr. Parker, but um, that seems operational, and, and I don't think we should be involved at that level. Um, that's why we decided that board members wouldn't be involved in the original choosing of the project manager, and I don't think we should be involved at this point. Um, so if there's an issue, then maybe they need to go back out um, and bring forward another name, but I don't think that we should be involved. As far as um, what I had asked for is with their, I think it is appropriate for the board to make sure that the most qualified applicant was chosen, which is why I asked to have an explanation why Balfour Beatty was chosen over the others, which we never received. Um, but I don't think we should be interviewing uh, potential project managers. Trustee Baker. I was going to say, I, I agree with um, Raphael and Amy. And I, I just wonder, unless there had been a significant change in Balford Beatty's um, ability to comply with what we needed, or if the scope of work had significantly changed as a result of the fires or some report that came to light, that I think would be interesting for us to hear about, because it, it would be a more of a policy direction, but I, I don't think it would be necessary or even helpful for us to, to um, interview or even see presentations from people who've already been passed up. I would tend to agree with uh, my colleagues as well. Amber? In uh, December, I remember I had a conversation with Mr. Parker about student housing, and he, he told me that there would be a contract coming to the board finalizing the relate the contract saying that Napa Valley College will move forward with Balford Beatty to begin construction and I've been waiting for that contract to come since December since I've I'm excited about the student housing project so I'm confused on where that is and I also agree with everyone who just spoke that I thought we had chosen Balford Beatty to be the ones to construct the student housing yeah, and unless they are reneging on the contract or they have some issues or problems that, you know, they, they may not be able to deliver what we would be contracting them with, and that mm -hmm. would be the only reason we, I would revisit the issue. Okay. Trustee Iverson. I hear all my fellow trustees, and I think they're all valid points, and maybe I'm a lone wolf on this one, but... I wouldn't be opposed to seeing presentations from the applicants and seeing an idea to 
go forward with the planning and address some of these other issues that have been brought up. So, I have personally been told that um, that Balfour Beatty might be more than what we need. It's kind of like a small one-person business going to some big five company to do their bookkeeping. Um, so I, you know, that's that's the only issue that I'm thinking is still in my head is is having second thoughts about is that more than what we need. But that's, I am assuming that the committee who, who went through those proposals considered all that and us going back, I think I think that's outside okay. our, our, okay. our purview uh, to get into that question that you just stated. Okay. So do we think though that we can, I mean at this point, we could rely on the committee to maybe have some. I'm hearing a, a little bit different, which is, okay. you know, the board is not wishing to see finalists ag again, you know, or the other or the other two. Um, I, I think we'll continue. Staff since the fires has been continuing to kind of look at the at the parameter of you know housing, and um, and we still are not, um, you know, we're. It, Things have, as you will, you know, um, Menver, things have been kind of on on hold a bit, you know, since the fires, because we weren't sure about housing stocks, we weren't sure about feasibility. Um, Mr. Orton's um, conversation is was well placed, and we are um, talking with city, and we're doing all of these kinds of things and unfolding. So, um, I hear I hear the board. So we won't bring them back for sure. Uh, w staff will probably discuss this if there's a significant change, then we'll we'll bring that um, through. But you'll probably see that in terms of you know contract um, language which is you know we've we've shifted based on these things and here's what we believe is the best for the for the college all three were um, met all the quals and that's why so it, it, it was a more of a fit conversation than it was a more qualified conversation if you will and although I, I, I did question why why an international company as opposed to a U.S. company when you know when the present when the the choice was announced here, but and when they made the presentation that one time, but you know if we've unless something else has come up that that you know merits. Yeah, I didn't. I'm, I'm not. I don't have any reflection really on a international company, a London-based company versus you know maybe a California-based company or how that might factor, um, but. Don't know. What, um, what I had asked for, and, and we never got, and I'm wondering if it's still possible, is to. So again, I'm looking at our housing policy, and it says that you know we delegate this responsibility to you, the president. But um, from what we saw, um, you know, we are obliged as a board to just ensure that the best qualified applicant was chosen. And so one of the things I'd asked for, and I was wondering if it was still possible to get, is to see. Not the blank rubric. We saw the blank rubric. I was wondering if it's possible to see where Balfour Beatty fell on the, the rubric, and then where the other applicants fell, crossing out their names, but just so we could see, sure. you know, how you came to your conclusion. And um, is, that, is that possible for the board to have that? Yeah, sure. Okay. And then the other thing I noticed, um, and I emailed you, um, Dr. Kraft, about this, but I just wanted to let the board know is that we have the board policy on housing, but it mentions and it was approved. Let's see, in 2015, um, and it mentions that there's still no AR, no administrative regulations for housing, and um, that it's still being developed. And I think given that we're as far as long as we are in the process, it seems like that would have come first. Um, so we have the board policy on housing that says we delegate this to you, but then the AR describes how you're going to implement that policy. And I think it would be gr a good time to develop that to see in writing what the process is. Um, and I actually found a CCLC template for the AR on housing. There is a template from the CCLC that could either just be adopted outright or maybe you modify it. But it seems like it would be good to write out how you're going to implement this board policy on housing and to have something in writing. And, and thank you. I mean, I think we had changed emails a little bit. And, and I might have misunderstood your 
question. So outlining the process that we use, you know, we always use a rubric, we, you know, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, would be, have you seen you know, the CCLC template? Because I oh, can I send it to you. Yeah. yeah, it just describes, and you can, I mean, it seems like it'd be one you either take outright or maybe you should shape it a little bit, but it seems like it would be good to have something in writing for both the board and also the public to know how that housing policy, and it actually mentions that it's optional, but it's legally recommended if you're considering pursuing housing, which we are, so. Good, uh, thank you. I think staff has a good, clear notion of, of your, your board's intent. Okay, okay. I think that's good. I think we've had enough on that. All right, we'll move forward to uh, 12.3, the update on uh, Mount Veter. That would be me. Who's Back that? Over there. Okay. Is this one? <laughs> okay, but this is it, right? Yes. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Mount Vitor property is one of four sites that the that the college district um, owns, utilizes, and um, for educational purposes. Um, and and this slide has has um, been used in the state of the college and and kind of our outreach. It it surprises people a little bit that we have a South Valley Campus Center at American Canyon High School, um, the the Upper Valley Campus at St. Helena our main campus here, and then the Napa Valley College Mount Veter Farm. We have two properties actually on Mount Veter. One is the Mount Veter Farm, which is an ongoing um, farm residence and um, location that has been utilized in, the, in that regard since the mid 80s. And the Clyde Preserve is more of an environmental protected. They both are, um, they're both, um, being able to be used by the college for educational, scientific, or aesthetic purposes. Clyde Preserve has many more codicils around it, um, mostly in protection. We could certainly take classes there to observe those kinds of things. Um, if we move down, here is the um, just a picture of the, this is Mount Veter, the fire kind of rolling down. That picture is um, the top of Mount Veter where our property um, actually lies. Um, and that's the, that's the fire from a distance. The, the property itself is typified, let me see if I can get up a little bit, typified by this picture. Um, we, and I'm sure there'll be more maybe coming from the, some of the committee who went up, but you can see the damage was very extensive on this piece of property. We have yet to tour the Clyde Preserve, but I would presume that it's a much the same case. Um, so there's a couple questions that really we have to address. Um, and I just put this little little snippet in here to show you that if, if a fire moves through rapidly as it did in many parts of the, of the county, just burning grass, the trees are pretty okay. And it works it's all its way over to this kind of scorch mentality. If, it, if the crown is consumed as many of those trees are up there, then you have to really, that's a dead tree it invites infestation and disease and, and or danger. So we have to kind of move through that process and figure out what we're going to do. Um, part of that looks like, and I, I hope you can read, oh, you, it comes up, it's all good. So um, there's a couple steps here. This is a first slide of two. Um, the first step it was to assess Mount Veter. Um, we have yet to, to um, physically visit the Clyde Preserve, but we will. Um, the damage to the infrastructure, the property and structures, that was an important aspect for us to do. Um, the second is consider options for repair. Um, what I would say is there's no option for doing nothing. I mean, this is a, a site, we need to do something with a, a, such a severely burned and dangerous piece. We had talked with a, a couple faculty members who wanted to take their students up there, but they can't. Um, it's still too dangerous. There's unknown kind of things. Um, Senator Bill Dodd, Assemblyman Member Cecilia Curry, it's not quite right, but I think that is, um, had a workforce summit here at the County Office of Education um, right after the fire. I, I think it was in November, early November, and they really talked about um, all the things that we might do, how we're going to address it. The college was there, of course. I think um, Trustee Mancusa was there as chair. Um, the Workforce Alliance of North Bay 
um, Bruce Wilson, um, presented a really unique opportunity for the college through a FEMA grant. And I will have to read, this says this, you probably can't read it, but it's a 2017 California Wildlife National Dislocated Worker Grant. That's in that third one, which basically says that there are monies through the state and the, and the Fed FEMA to help um, fire damaged areas put people to work who lost their, their wherewithal, maybe lost their jobs or, or, or are available. Um, to repair, clean up those things. Um, being a public agency, we met another piece of criteria which was good. Educational puts us as a, also a good thing. Um, there's no dollars involved from the district with this, which is a, a nice boon for us. Can um, I add something, Ron? Yes, so that money absolutely. was only um, ear, it was only earmarked for public property. Public, yes, public property. I'm yeah. sorry, I might have missed yeah, it. Yeah, it can't be used to yeah. clean up or repair anything private. Yes, not your private home or anything, yes. Thank you. So we met all the criteria. Um, I, I met with um, Mr. Wilson. We, we came over. He explained the grant process. He thought we were a perfect fit for it, especially seeing what's what's happening up there. Here's the next steps. That, that one on the left says define the parameters. I think that we, that's why I put that little snippet. We need a consulting arborist. You know, what do you take down? What do you not take down? What's going to grow back? What makes sense? Some are very clearly so burned and falling over that there's no question there. Um, and then there's infrastructure repair. So there's a road on the property that runs from the bottom of the property pretty much all the way through um, the top of the property. That's, that's um, gravel and dirt. It was damaged. It needs to be repaired. There's gutters and rain pieces that were washed out. And, and um, I, we haven't been up since the rains, and hopefully we're not going to get too much more. Then there are watershed areas, retreat areas, which is a picnic and leadership areas that are in disrepair. Some of that didn't physically get burned, but everything around it got burned, so I'm not sure how we're going to address that. Piping, electrical, signage, drainage, some of those things. The, the college has already repaired a pipe um, from our um, existing well across our property to the neighbors. The middle thing says de uh, develop a plan and timelines. Safety and compliance are the first things. So we want to make sure that we address, um, as I talked about, I think last last time, what's affectionately called a widowmaker tree. It's it's ready to fall on somebody. Those those need to be addressed quickly. Um, and access and egress of the roads still not. It. There's no there's no secondary um, egress from the property that was closed down by the burn. And same for the neighbors. The neighbors, where they could have come into Mount Veter and exited through the Mount Veter property, that's closed down because of the burn as well. So there's things that we need to do there. Resurface the roads, um, repair. There's a water tower up there that um, it, it, it wouldn't have done any good in that big, huge fire, but it was intended to fight fires. And so we need to take a look at that as well. And then the last one is information to constituencies, make sure everybody's on board. Um, and, you know, what we've been talking about tonight is, thor you know, thorough integrated planning. So um, what we can do is get, um, the, the college is not the employer of record in this grant. It's a independent um, group, which I believe I wrote down here. Um, I did not. Um, but it, it is a... Um, uh, Campesinos de something, I cannot remember, um, but they are, they alleviate all of our um, liability for workers' comp, for, for any of that. They are the, the employer of record. Um, so this is, I'm just bringing the board up to speed on this. We're moving forward on the grant. Bob is, you know, kind of spearheading this with Matt Christensen. We'll, um, I, I would say that there are chances that we would have started on some of the emergency work prior to the next board meeting, but m maybe not. I mean, there's plenty of work here for at least, the the, a quick estimate is six months to a year for people to, this is a, this is a bunch of acreage up there. You know, t in total over 200 acres of severely burned um, property. So we're figuring it out. So that's the update. Thank you. Any questions on that? Trustee Martinson. I don't know if this is the right time, but um, I've been thinking for a while and this kind of, brings it back for me. Maybe at some point, um, 
we could because I looked at the deed for this property and my when I read it I think it seems very clear that it's supposed to be maintained as a nature preserve that it's supposed to be remain in its natural or wilderness state um, but yeah we've talked about vineyards and farming and um, have we ever gotten an opinion from the land trust if it can actually be used in that way because I think we maybe need to look at is this a liability that should go back to the land trust or is it something that we want to continue to maintain um, there's two properties. The Clyde Preserve is, the, and I sent you that deed that I think you probably read. I read both the, of them. Yeah. And the Clyde Preserve is clearly m more aesthetic with more codicils around it. I, I think it, it's pretty clear. Um, Bumpy Camp, or Mount Veter Farm, um, has um, a history of farming on it. It's, it's, it's been disturbed and, preserved and not unpreserved for since since the college has taken possession of that. The intent was to not clear cut it. Not, there's a lot of Mount Veter. If you were to do it a Google Earth shot and look at, at Mount Veter, you would see that there are many areas up that are all vineyards. Um, but there are several meadows and planted areas that um, are more visible now because of the fire and it's easier to see. So we would absolutely come back to the board and explain the long-term plan and um, how that that coordinates um, with our programs, certainly viticulture, agriculture, biology, botany, um, leadership, business. So many have expressed interest in um, utilizing the property for those educational pieces. Yes, that's my question, because when, when I read both deeds, it talks about that mostly it's for... So, excuse me, I think that this topic is about cleanup of the fire damage. Okay, so I guess I'm saying I'd like that so to come back So this would be a, a different agenda okay. item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to 12.4 uh, textbooks, and I believe that is VP Archer, right? Oh, you're not alone. That's, that's always a good thing. Cynthia, stop. Just stop. Thank you. Chair, are we planning to take a recess to, soon? Um, start updating in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, so be, uh, um, be Eric, before you oh, yes. hold yeah, on a second. How, what's your anticipation of this? How long do do we think? <laughs> so we're we're contemplating a short. I I was break. gonna. People that like to talk up here, but I think we can probably <laughs> be sustained. No so, manifestos tonight. So I was thinking about having a break at the end of information items, but I think we'll go ahead and take a quick break now. Uh, yeah, so that you get everybody's full attention. All right. So we'll uh, we'll say back thank here you. at eight fifteen. Perfect. Thank you. I think that's smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every time I was thinking about dodging out, I was like, damn, it's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> really messed my me up. Mm -hmm. How's it going? Kind of sort of. Yeah, kind of sort of. Yeah. I think I'm hearing more kind of. What? Thank you. 
Shoot me a date that works for you. Tuesdays and Thursdays are the best days because I have a babysitter. Find his information. I mean, I thought what he gave us was nice information. 9:30. You think you're, you're that optimistic? We're gonna get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Was it 9:30? <laughs> Normally, you're so cute. <laughs> Is everybody here? No, Ron's not back yet. Get coffee. Wait, now I am. <laughs> Arborist. Now we have these water I, water stations. I would agree. I'm I'm all for it. I have no problem with that. Thanks. It's after the, isn't it before the R? A-R-B-O-H. I'm going to Google. I'm trying to, I can only, I can only spell what I can visualize. Hey. Oh, I was walking the halls of. Uh, oh. Well, I, yeah, I can't. It's too high. Is it? But what? I almost think it's like. Is it? Because like yeah, you, I can't. Well, see, this is correct, right? Right. This it's. Is, I think it's how it's being projected somehow, but I don't know how to. So this one, Chrome works, right? You can see the... But that one does, but when you bring it up, if it's on the board docs, it's just those PDFs. When you bring it up, what happened to board docs? Did it shut down again? I don't know. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. So now we have it. I think it was just the browser window you were in. Let me, was, see. Let me see. See? Now it's it there. Was, but when we, but it, when. Oh my God, we're going to be here for Oh, yes. 
This is going to be a 10 o'clocker. No. Don't say it is. Okay, so like here I open back up. All right, but if you open the document. So now it's there. I think it was just glitched. I think you're good now. Yeah, because it was like, I, how can I turn this down? What you do have well, to Well, the PowerPoint was down there. Yeah. This has to be saved so we can get it. Ah. <laughs> All right, we will uh, get back to our regularly scheduled program. Yeah. Oh, it was already there. Sorry. And I believe we left off with textbooks, <laughs> VP Shear and Professor Badgett. All right, good evening, Board of Trustees. So yes, absolutely, I wanna, I wanna note that I am not presenting this alone, and there's a very good reason for that, and that's because the topic that we're talking about is fundamentally an academic issue. And so for me as the Vice President to get up and uh, pontificate on textbooks and textbook costs, et cetera, is not uh, entirely appropriate. And so it's really important that I'm here with the President of the Academic Senate. Um, and just as a reminder, the Academic Senate is the body that's responsible for all academic and professional matters for faculty. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague here briefly because we have an art history lecture, I think, to oh. start off the... Uh... <laughs> Good evening, board, again. So um, as I was working with the VPI on this, um, I can't talk about anything without image. So that's actually not a great, very high-resolution image, but that's St. Jerome, who was always shown reading. He's um, a scholar, so. And I won't get into the artist, and because you, you want to leave tonight, so. <laughs> but yeah, so we thought it was very appropriate to have an image of books in this. So um, I'm going to start off, and, and really what I'm going to do here for you tonight, um, and Amanda and I will be going back and forth on these slides here, I'm, I'm providing just a very high, over, high level overview, um, the background with um, textbooks in our system, charging students for instructional materials, give you some of the legal background of it, give you higher level stuff too about legislation that's related to textbooks, and some of the state level issues that have come up around that. And then I'll be, uh, and, and then I'll be passing everything about, about local decisions and faculty faculty processes and all of that uh, to Amanda in this. So to start off with, so one of the things to remember with the California Community College System is that by design in the uh, education master plan from the 1960s, community colleges are free and they are open. They are still technically free and they are still technically open. Um, those of you uh, who've attended a community college, including myself, may remember actually paying for things um, as, you, as you went in. So the idea that it is free um, is uh, limited. Any, any deviation from free and open access has to be specifically authorized by a statute. And so one of, the, one of the things that we look at uh, under this is what I have a, a, up here on the page for you. It's actually the citation from Education Code. Students can be charged for instructional materials that, uh, with certain parameters around that. And a textbook is a type of instructional material. And so this is the, under, this is the underlying regulation the, that uh, provides for this in the system. Um, a couple of things to note on this, so the law provides that students can only be required to, pro uh, to provide materials which are of continuing value to the student outside of the classroom setting. There's a whole document that the Chancellor's Office puts out that defines what continuing value means, and it's about 70 pages long or so uh, going into the instances of, of uh, continuing value to the students. Um, so again, when we're talking about textbooks, this is the statute, this is the part of the, of the code that we're looking at um, that kind of governs how and what we do related to textbooks textbooks, and it's all about instructional materials. So how many of you went to college? How many of you bought textbooks? How many of you thought you paid too much for textbooks? Yeah, uh, and I want to note here that there is absolutely no generational gap 
in, in what just in what just happened in here. This is something that all that, that all of us have faced. This is something that, that that's been a, that's been a part of this for a long time. Um, there have been changes, and I'll get into some of the changes in the law that have kind of changed the, the the ground that we're on with this right now. But what I have up here is just a quick graph um, that we pulled from actually a state academic senate presentation on the cost of textbooks. The cost of textbooks have gone up. Now, what's not visible in the information that, that, that's there and, and some of what Amanda will touch on in this is that a textbook today is not the same thing as a textbook 50 years ago. In fact, one of our instructors earlier today came into my office very rapidly uh, with two examples of textbooks from a hundred years ago, uh, r roughly, um, w one of which still costs forty dollars today. By the way, I want to I want to note it, it's also there's it, it's a beautiful book. I love old books. There's not a single image anywhere in it. It's there's not a single chart anywhere in it. There's not a single graph anywhere in it. There's not any of the things that go into a modern textbook. All of which uh, increase the publication costs. So the modern textbook is very different from the textbook of a hundred years ago, fifty years ago, and I would even say there are different there are subtle differences between from when I was a college student and what we're looking at today. So this is a, a text that's probably too small to see up on the screen, but you might be able to see it here on this. This is just a sample showing from one university the average cost of text textbooks by discipline for a single class. And so uh, topping the list is economics. So at this particular, this is at the University of Virginia, by the way, uh, $317 per section uh, in textbooks. Uh, languages, chemistry, physics, all coming down underneath that. This really does. This this speaks not just to the um, the cost of the book itself, but the complexity of the material that's being delivered and the way it's in which it's delivered in the in the books. But you can see that there's a wide range of costs that are associated with textbooks for students, depending on what class it is that they're actually enrolled in. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Badgett. So um, at this point. Seeing as we just saw that, that chart, I, I would like to um, provide a little uh, input from one of my colleagues here at the college who has actually written and gotten a textbook published, Dr. Stephen Fall. And I uh, solicited input from my colleagues on this topic, and I will read just a, a small portion of what's Steve responded, uh, how he responded, and he said that um, his book, which is a chemistry textbook, is comparatively small. It's only 700 pages, and, um, and his argument is that uh, it took him nearly more than 4,000 hours to complete the project, and he wrote every word and created every illustration, and so from his point of view, it would be very difficult to to make that free because he's actually put the time, effort, creativity into the textbook. So I wanted to just offer that as someone within our own fold here who has um, published a textbook in his field. It is, in fact, $105, which is uh, much uh, less expensive than the 200 or 300 of most textbooks, so uh, worth noting. Um, so as Eric's alluded to, um, textbooks fall often under the larger uh, idea of academic freedom, which is that faculty have the right and the responsibility to choose based on their expertise, based on what they're teaching, how they plan to teach it, how they plan to assess the students that they're teaching. They, based on that and many factors, have the right to choose um, a textbook or ancillary materials that support the content as um, approved in the course outline of record. So, um, and so what I would say towards that end is that when it comes to textbooks or whatever supporting material faculty use, um, I can tell you, certainly from my experience on this campus, and I'm willing to wager this is true everywhere, that faculty are taking into consideration the often exorbitant cost of textbooks and ancillary material. And that, when I say that, I mean sort of online um, homework modules and so forth. So even on this campus, we have many classes that don't have a text at all. Um, our, many of our studio art classes, for example, 
uh, might have the students buying materials, but there is not a textbook per se. Uh, we have many instructor generated, and I'm not referring to Dr. Fall here, but instru instructor generated material, um, lab manuals, um, readers that obviously are compliant with copyright law. Um, that is something that many professors, and it does seem to be characteristic of professors, are not ever satisfied with a textbook, and so many of them generate their own, many of which are available at our bookstore. The lab manuals are like $11, and they were generated by our um, chemistry and bio biology faculty. Many, and this, I fall into this third category, offer uh, students the option of going with earlier editions. Um, in art history, uh, there is the motivation on the part of publishers to crank out new editions every few years. The canon of art history changes rarely, and I have opted to uh, give my students the option of just finding the text uh, in a, you know, a cheaper version of the text online or wherever. Um, and then the other point to make is that even within a department, a faculty member can, though some members opt for a textbook, online, homework, some faculty within the same department may opt out, and that is another kind of extension of academic freedom. So the bottom line is that disciplines vary in the, their um, reliance upon the newest textbook, the newest textbook with a code to online um, homework module. Um, but, and, and I guess what I, having had the opportunity now to talk to my colleagues about this, I see an opportunity for further conversation. So I'm actually going to bring, uh, Eric's about to apprise you of some of the initiatives statewide about um, open uh, educational resources and these zero degrees, we're going to have to, a discussion at the Senate about these very initiatives to, to open up to faculty what options there are so that everyone is fully apprised. I will say that I am personally going to phase out of using a textbook, but for me to find rigorous, good, well-vetted material will take me a couple of years, because there's just a lot of dreck out there. And while there are these resources that can kind of channel you towards, and I'm, Eric may refer to them, there's one called Merlot. Um, again, depending on the content and, and the particular way I teach, it will take me a, a substantial amount of time to find a replacement to my text. So that's just another sort of uh, perspective on this from a faculty member. So I think at this point I will cede the floor. Yeah, and so just to under underscore that, just, just know that the selection of a textbook in any college classroom is not a light matter. This is something that is uh, discussed, that is vetted, and that uh, comes to, the faculty come to after a long process. Um, so talk about some other changes legally in the, in, in the legal environment that we're in. So in 2012, there was a change, there was an amendment to the Title V regulations related to textbook um, that got into the notion of something having lasting value outside of the classroom. One of the reasons that this was done was the rise of electronic textbooks and online resources for students. Um, and so the, in 2012, the, the law was actually changed um, um, to, to include uh, uh, that that the continuing the 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 notion that it has continuing value to the student outside of the classroom would be extended to electronic material provided that the student had access to that material for a two year period from the date of purchase and so that went into into effect at all one hundred and fourteen community colleges when this law changed publishers uh, came forward and made it and made changes to how the licensing worked, so the fee that the students paid for the license to access the electronic material is supposed to guarantee a two-year period beyond the, that point in time, and that's inclusive of, of tests and homework that are done through that online platform. Um, uh, all of those are, are considered under the law to have lasting value to the student. And so that's, that was the major change that came in 2012 to this. However, there were a couple of protections that were put in place here. So the first one uh, required 
requires that all electronic materials be primarily for instruction and not designed primarily for administrative purposes. So an example of that. We have, um, we used Blackboard for many years for our distance education courses. We now use a platform called Canvas. That is an administrative tool that allows us to deliver content to our students. Charging a student to access Canvas simply because that's the platform we use and we want to get a fee out of the students to fund our adoption of that particular platform for distance education is specifically prohibited under the law. So that, that's something that was part of the protection that was put in place. Um, and again, as it says in the second bullet, the second protection was that there needed to be continuing access to it beyond the duration of the class. And so the, those were the two caveats that were put into place when this law changed in 2012. So as you can imagine, as, as we saw from the hands, textbook cost is an issue for, for modern students, current students, and historically it's been an issue for students. Um, in California, in the community college system, because of, our, because of the uh, importance that we are in open access and technically we're a free institution that doesn't charge tuition, the, uh, the legislature and the state chancellor's office, the state academic senate, and a lot of folks that are involved in this have really looked for other ways of going about doing this to help either defray the cost of textbooks for students um, or to offer additional alternatives to faculty that they, can, that they can explore. So the list that you have up here in front of you, this is just the last seven or eight years of different assembly bills and senate bills that have gone through that are related to the, tech, to the cost of textbooks. I'm going to focus on two that came out from this in the next slide. So the first one, uh, which was originally authorized by AB 1602, is what they call the zero cost textbook degree program. So what this is, is, is a financial incentive from the chancellor's office for local faculty to develop degrees that have no textbook costs associated with them. And so uh, it's a very small grant that, that, that's given from the chancellor's office for implementation, and it, the grant is not to pay for the cost of textbooks. So these don't become zero textbook cost degrees because we got a grant that paid for the textbook. The grant is small, and in in, I, I think per college it was around $150,000. Um, so really what that was for was for staff time to research alternatives to printed textbooks and, and uh, instructional materials that cost something. So so this is actually a really interesting program. 23 of 114 community colleges are currently participating in this. And so in those colleges, faculty have identified particular disciplines where it made sense to do it and there was a way of doing it that, that maintained the rigor that was necessary for those disciplines. Um, going forward, each one of those 23 colleges in any college that chooses to participate in the future is required to put a little icon in their catalog indicating degrees that you can get um, without any textbook cost associated with with them. And so this is an ongoing uh, cyclical grant program. I'm certain it'll be re-upped again here. There'll be another uh, uh, call for proposals going out. More people will get involved with this going along. But this is, enough, this is one of the options that the legislature helped to uh, facilitate and the governor helped fund for the community college system for the adoption of a different way of going about doing this. Right. Yeah. Are, are we yeah. participating or not yeah, yet? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Stop me. Uh, oh, no. I'm just wondering <laughs> if we're participating in that program or oh are we participating no we we did not apply for the ztc grant the last cycle on that was fall of 2016 and um i haven't spoken to the chancellor's office about it again but like i said it this is going to be a cyclical thing that will open up periodically and so the college could could look at this and if the faculty found found value in it we could apply for one of those grants going forward thank you the second major thing that's come out in the last few years from, uh, from legislation related to the cost of textbooks is what's called the Open Educational Resources. Um, and, and what this is actually, um, there were multiple bills that were associated with this one. This actually called into creation an Open Educational Resources Council that's inclusive of all three systems of higher education in California. It requires participation of the CSU and the community college systems, and as is the way with law, they can't tell the UCs what to do, but they strongly encouraged and suggested participation. Um, so this is a state-level group of, of faculty that have been working for a couple of years on, uh, through uh, the, the ICUS, the Intersegmental 
I forget what the acronym means because I use too many of them all the time. It's a shared governance body between the three systems of higher education where the three academic senates from the community colleges, the CSU and the UCs get together and hammer out policy. And so under the auspices of ICUS, the uh, OER has been working for the last couple of years. I'm not going to read through all of this. Just to let you know that it's another thing that's out there. The focus of OER as opposed to the ZTC degrees, um, OER is really about building resources and building a report repository of, of instructional material that faculty can tap into. So these are things that are, that are in the public domain or they are under a Creative Commons license uh, as opposed to being copyrighted material that faculty would have to pay for the cop, uh, the, would have to pay to use in, the, in their classrooms. So oftentimes again this is licensed under the, uh, under the common, uh, pardon me, the Creative Commons licensing as opposed to being uh, copyrighted. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, funding that's come down from that. Again, when we talk about a lot of funding, we're not talking about funding that pays for textbooks. We're talking about small bits of grants that are given out for local colleges to do the work that would be necessary to explore the options that are out there and incorporate what's possible in. Um, OER has fantastic promise. It also has a lot of pitfalls to it as well. Um, it, you know, the, the online, edu the open educational resources that are out there, I can tell you from having looked at them before myself, looking for my own, own discipline previously, um, th they're of varying quality. And sometimes you get something good, sometimes you don't. It can be something as bad as a really bad YouTube video, um, all the way through a very good scholarly article that's been licensed through Creative Commons. And so there's a lot of material out there under under that, but there are resources that are out there and that are available and that faculty can tap into. So again, this is just a, a quick summary of some of the more recent, uh, recent resources that were out there. So the ZTC degree, the Open Educational Resource Council, the Digital Open Source Library, which is a branch off from the OER. Uh, the California Textbook Affordability Act, this was a grant that was given to colleges to help adopt uh, open educational resources. And then finally, another one that's come up more recently is the California Promise Innovation Grants. Uh, the, our college applied for one of these a year and a half ago. We did not get it. That's one of the many grants that are out there, though, that really gets at what's on the bottom of this slide, and it's the part that I want to emphasize. Um, the, the cost of textbooks are, are, are high. All of us are, are aware of that. It's a difficult part of, part of higher education here in California for us. What we have found to be the most effective practices uh, for the students is really getting to grants and funding sources that help defray the cost of the textbook. Um, and so grants that actually get money in the hands of students uh, to pay for the textbooks are, are, are a surer way of getting at that rather than going in the back end and trying to do something about the publishing system or the, or the textbooks themselves. And so there's a lot of options out there. We're looking at a MESA grant right now, actually a STEM grant that uh, we're looking at applying for right now that has as a major component of it money for textbook for STEM students. So those are the sorts of uh, innovative ways uh, that the college is going out trying to look for additional funding and other revenue sources that can help to defray the cost of the textbooks for students. So with that, what questions do you have for us? Manavir? Oh, actually, yeah. Chair? Job chair. Yes, Manavir. I find the term academic freedom ironic. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, academic freedom applies to the teacher, correct? That they have the freedom to teach how they want. Correct. But academic freedom doesn't apply to the student to want on how they want to learn. It's, it's the teacher has the freedom to say, we're going to learn like this, and there's no freedom in the student's part. And actually, why can't we learn this way? And I'll, an example of that would be uh, in math. It's the, the way to go is uh, we either use my math lab to do homework or a web assign. But there's no option of using the textbook and do questions out of those, like back in the day in high school. It's, you have to do it through uh, WebAssign in my math lab. It would dramatically lower the cost if there was the freedom to do homework out of the math textbooks we already have in the library, which would mean the student would have the option to do homework either through the math textbook that the library already has I am uh, confident to say almost everybody has a phone which has the capability to take a picture. You go to the library, you open that book, take a picture, you put, put it right behind the library where they have, the, where they have all the current, current textbooks. And if a student would like to have the option of using the tools that WebAssign has, it gives you options of help, access to a tutor, 
you did it wrong this way. If they want that option, they can go and buy the software for around $200, but it would drastically lower the cost of education if there was the option to just use the textbook simply. And to add on to that, uh, Khan Academy, and on YouTube there's a channel called Math BFF. Uh, they are very effective in teaching the material, and it brings into the question, in today's day and age, do we still need a physical textbook? I know that's a really radical point. It's just begging the question, in today's day, there's YouTube, the internet, and unless there's a blackout of it, it's going to be there forever. And uh, yeah, if you want to comment back on that. Thank you. So I, I will just jump in here, Manveer, and I hear what you're saying, because it does seem, because certainly when I was a student, that was how I did math homework. Somebody assigned me pages 20 through 30, do the problems, and bring in the work, and I'll grade it. And, and in my case, um, I might have done all of them wrong, thought I was on it, and would find out only getting the homework back I hadn't done it. So what my colleagues um, have shared with me is, admittedly, it is pricey, but that software allows a student to know immediately whether they're doing it right or not. And then it will pop up with, here's a reminder what you know the formula is. And oh, if you need further refresher, here's a video. Now you're right. Uh, somebody could piece all that together between Khan Academy, YouTube, et cetera. But it is actually an immediate feedback that a student gets to hone a skill, and the more and the more and the more, especially in mathematics, a student has an opportunity to, in real time, realize, oh, I'm not doing this right, the, the more likely the student will gain the skill. It, I will say the math department on our campus opted for an OER um, with a sort of connected, uh, fairly inexpensive, if not free, test, not test, excuse me, homework module, and it w ended up being a lot of extra work for a part-timer who is not paid to spend office hours putting together worksheets. So there are pedagogical reasons, and these faculty are not unaware of the cost that is incurred by use, making these choices, but they are, not, they are doing it for very sound pedagogical reasons. They really are. So I'm going to. I have one follow-up. That's it. Sure. Go ahead. I would That's be, why we have a student trustee for these kind of issues. I would be very curious to see if students would, if a poll was taken in a math class, would students like to have the option to do homework like you did back in the day, or would they prefer to use the online tool and to see which way that vote would go and would they rather spend the few hundred dollars every semester, 200 every semester, the 175 roughly if you want to do the two-year thing, or would they prefer to do it for free and take on the burden? And I would be really curious to see which way the class would vote on that. Fair point. First, how do you like that comment back in the day? I know, that's okay, belay me, it's back, way back in the day. I'm agreeing with um, you on that. I, uh, I, I, like I would that. simply say that actually in uh, the math department, depending on the class, there is a professor who does not use the text, uh, the, the uh, software, so there are options. Um, so I'm gonna yeah. step out. I'm curious, out of all of the legislation, all of the options, all of the things that you've brought forward to it, is there anything there that is that you're having conversations about that looks really interesting that might be a change that you want to implement yeah yeah so that's oh. what i was going to say actually just just in the process of preparing the preparing this presentation and working with amanda on it the conversations that have sprung up among the among the faculty could very well point towards something right. uh, in that there's some there's some wonderful options out there though there's some right. really interesting and progressive programs okay any it's other kind of related to what you're saying, where you're going with this? Um, I, I think it would be great. I know that the board cannot 
tell instructors what to do because of the academic freedom. Totally get that. But what Thank the you. board could do, and even the academic could, Senate could do, or we could do together, is could issue some kind of policy statement or resolution expressing its desire that instructors use the least expensive or the most inexpensive instructional resources while maintaining rigor. So that. So I'm just putting that out there, that that could be an option just to raise awareness. Um, and then I had more question for, I guess, Dr. Kraft, because um, I know uh, just in the last few years we shifted from running our own bookstore to using Barnes & Noble, and I'm wondering if there was ever any analysis to see what that shift from our own books, using our own bookstore to using a, a corporate for-profit company, what that did to the cost of books. Um, no, I don't think we've done that analysis and pre and post. I, Bob, do you have any take on that? Carolee, either, either so one? I'd be interested in that just because, you know, it's, we have a mission of trying to keep costs down. A, a for-profit company doesn't have that mission. They want to make money. So I just think that would be worth looking at just to see what that did to the price of books. Easy to, easy to get. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. That was a lot to uh, to digest and very informative. Yes. Okay, I believe 12.5, Jan Chart was going, or you're doing this. Uh, um, yes. Real, yes. just kind of. So yes, 12.5 is, um, oops, can you go back? I'm sorry, is it too late? Yeah, 12.5 is a Napa Valley College Association of Classified Professionals negotiation on initial proposal dated um, the 30. This item is placed um, on the agenda um, with the attached initial proposal dated um, January 30, 2018 from the Napa Valley College of Classified Professional Representative SCIU Local 1021 to the Napa Valley Community College District. And normally um, Jan would be here to read this, but I'm happy to do that. Um, in accordance with this collective bargaining agreement between the Napa Valley Community College District and the Service Employee International Union, SEIU Local 1021, SEIU Local 1021 hereby makes official notice for full contract negotiations with the intent of opening any article in the contract, including all side letter agreements, memoranda of understanding, and any other contractual instrument between the parties. The collective bargaining agreement between the Napa Valley Community College District and SEIU Local Local 1021 expires on June 30, 2018, and the union wishes to commence full contract negotiations. Please sunshine this letter as our request for full contract um, contract negotiations at the next board meeting, which we are happy to do. SCIU Local 1021 has the right to add, amend, modify, or delete any proposal during the negotiations process. And that's sincerely Nathan Hansford. He's our SEIU field representative. And Jan Shart in BC, SEIU 1021 chapter pres. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'll move on to 12.6. Mm -hmm. You also want to take that on? Sure. Um, this is this is presentation of Napa Valley Community College District initial proposal for the contract period beginning J1 2018 to the Napa Valley College Association of Classified Professionals. So um, this is the uh, the opening proposal of intent from the college. Um, in the spirit of interest-based bargaining, the district seeks to address interests and concerns related to the employment of classified professionals at Napa Valley College. The district has an interest in working collaboratively, collaboratively with the Association of Classified Professionals to create a multi-year agreement that will be mutually beneficial. Specifically, Article 5, Vacancies. The district has an interest in clarifying the language in this article, including the definition of vacancy and breaks in service. Article 9, Wages and Fringe Benefits. The district has an interest in negotiating compensation. Such negotiation will consider the district's goal of operating in a physically responsible manner. The district recognizes that the cost of health and welfare benefits financially impact both the district and the membership of the Napa Valley College Association of Classified Professionals. The district wishes to explore options to address the issue of increasing costs of both employee and retiree benefits as well as the unfunded liability for retiree health benefits. Article 11, leave. 
The district has an interest in updating this article to reflect provisions of new laws and regulations, include information regarding Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA, and California Family Rights Act, CFRA, and clarify that language. Article 20, staff development. The district has an interest in providing appropriate staff development opportunities that, both, that support both the classified professionals and the need of the college. Article 24, discipline. The district has an interest in reviewing the discipline language for clarification and possible revision. The district reserves the right to amend, modify, delete, add to, or subtract from this proposal until such time as a completed agreement is reached. In addition to the listed articles, the district has an interest to review, edit, and clean up non-substantive and outdated language in the collective bargaining agreement to facilitate clarity and better use of the agreement. And that is it. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Thank you. And next, we have 12.7 first reading college and career access pathways CCAP, and I believe that's uh, that's Eric Shear again. Yeah, yeah, and I'll and I'll do this one from here so I don't go on for too long. I know it is late. This is, I, I've, I've let you know for the last couple of meetings that this was forthcoming. Um, so the MOU that you have here in front of, of you for information purposes tonight is a proposed MOU between Napa Valley Community College District and the St. Helena Unified School District. This would be to enact the new type of dual enrollment that was made possible a couple of years ago by changes to state law. So the, uh, the, we've been do, doing dual enrollment for a long, long time uh, with our local high schools. This is a new type of dual enrollment that's, uh, that's been provided for under the law that allows us f to teach our class on the high school campus du during their day um, and close that to just the high school students. And so this is a really exciting new opportunity that we have to expand on what I talked about earlier, and that's that collaborative work together to really look at what we do here in, the, in our county as a K-14 effort, not just a K-12 and a college effort. Um, so this MOU is very long. Uh, this is the boilerplate language from the state, though. So this is, this is what the agreement looks like for the state. So this has to cover every single aspect of the law um, that enabled this type of dual enrollment to happen. So it goes, and so under that law, it comes to you for, uh, for an inf as an information item and then comes as an action item at a subsequent month, at month. It is doing the same thing at St. Helena Unified School District. So they are taking it to their board tomorrow and then, uh, and then we will get any feedback from them. I'll gather any feedback from you. If any adjustments need to be made in the coming weeks, we will do so before it comes back as an action item. Um, and we intend to do that as an action item in April. And so that's what we have here in front of us. Really exciting. This is our first one of the uh, first one of the CCAP dual enrollment agreements. This is a really good one for us too. This is math. And so what we're proposing to do in this agreement is that we will offer either a math 106 and 108 sequence, which is our college algebra and then basically pre-calculus past that as a sequence. So that's the first and second semester of college math in fall and spring at St. Helena, or we'll offer uh, math 94, which is intermediate algebra, and then math 106 in the spring, depending on how their students assess into our math classes. The high school students have to meet every provision of uh, academic standards and rigor to be able to enter the course. They have to be able to meet the prerequisites for the course. Um, and we're really excited to do this with them also because in this particular instance, their math teacher is also our math teacher. So the math teach, one of the math teachers at St. Helena and the one that we would be working with to do this is currently employed by Napa Valley Community College District as well as one of our adjunct math teachers. So we have a really unique opportunity here with this one to do, uh, to do, our, to do our first agreement of this sort with a school district um, with a lot of known entities. So that's what you have here in front of you. Questions? Yes, Trustee Martinson. So um, the only question I had, so it kind of goes back to the cost of books, and so I, I read that it, it said that the instructional materials and costs um, are responsibility of the school district, the St. Helena school district. Is the school district picking up those costs, or is it really the students, because the school the, district is the paying? The school district pays for that. Okay, because I remember at, when I was at Valley Oak that that was an issue, because I, I promoted the free courses, and then the students signed up, and then they had to pay for an $80 book, and they... 
like a bunch of them dropped out. So yeah, and that's what makes these these uh, agreements different from the type of dual enrollment that we've done that we've done before and are still doing right now. These are very different agreements, and that's you know the 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 specificity is why the length of the MOU is what it is. That's but yes, great. absolutely, the district picks up the cost of those textbooks. So the the Saint Helena Unified School District would be going into this understanding the costs associated with it. That's great. Thank you. I know that. Uh, American Canyon, for instance, has a cooking school or yes. the, a culinary program. Are there things that down the road that would require certain equipment or that, that could be in this program that could actually do this, accomplish this? Yeah, so career education is the other major focus for these types of dual enrollment programs. Um, we've had a lot of interest and uh, interest from, from our side as well. Um, and in the future, absolutely something could be developed that was a joint effort in that way uh, through okay. this sort of dual enrollment process. It really provides a seamless transition for those students too. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so we've gotten through information items now. And we're ready to uh, move on to the consent calendar. So I will um, entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Consent calendar approved. And we move to 14.1 action items. Uh, and the first is the 14.1 spring 2018 curriculum changes. Move approval. Second. Oh, you second. Baldini, move to approve. Baker, second. All in favor? I have a question. Okay. Yes. I question. I, yeah. And this, so I had a question about the new dance program, the a new AA for dance. So I just, I'm just trying to understand that we had the presentation on how new programs come in, and one of the things they talked about um, is that for a new vocational program, you have to do this labor market demand study and it has to meet some labor market need. So I'm just wondering, is dance not considered vocational? Is that why it's outside that process? Or how did what's defined as vocational yeah, versus so, not? Yeah, so vo vocational is determined by the taxonomy of program code that's associated with it. So every, uh, every piece of curriculum that goes through our system is assigned a top code, as they call it, and only those in the top code manual with an asterisk next to it are considered to be vocational or career technical education in nature. Um, and if your discipline doesn't have that next to it, then you're not then you're not bound by the LMI and the other elements that we have to go through for a, a, a career oriented goal. So this one wasn't didn't have that asterisk. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Raphael, where are you? Oh, there you are. Um, has a quick comment or question about this. Hi. Um, I apologize. I uh, don't normally make public comments. Um, honestly, I uh, guess I just never muster up the courage or I don't feel particularly that I, that I have something to contribute um, on an item. I think that the uh, discussion gets very spirited as it is and I do recognize that it is late um, and even at my own board meetings for the associated students it um, you know it runs late and everyone wants to move right along I just wanted to make a comment um, I didn't know if I could on action items um, and uh, I, I just want to make a comment of support for the dance degree um, you know it's uh, it's something that as a student in the dance program, we've wanted for so long, um, and we are really one of the only community colleges in California who uh, doesn't have one yet. Um, and and really, it's like I haven't been a dancer for very long. Um, the first class I took was at this college, and um, I I've been a student here for many years now, and so time time flies really. And I've taken almost every single dance class that's ever been offered. Um, I've performed in the uh, performances, the concerts, the dance concerts, multiple times. 
Um, and I've even volunteered as a, as a uh, teacher's assistant in the dance department, approved by the board. Um, all volunteers are approved by the board. So I just really wanted to make a quick comment. I wanted to go on record and say that, you know, my name is Rafael Monzo. I'm a student here on campus. I've been a student here for many years, and I've been a student in the dance department. And we really, really want uh, a dance degree and, and dance major. Um, you know, right now, my major is, is theater arts, and I'll be collecting all of the degrees in theater arts. I've been here long enough to attain that. But I would love to be able to collect my dance degree before I graduate this college, um, just to have even another certification in a discipline that I've taken classes so much in. Um, I, I just wanted to make uh, go on record and make an, a comment of support. Um, thank you. I really appreciate it. I didn't know if I could make a comment on an action item. Thank you. You can, Raphael, at any time that you like. You just uh, turn the card in prior to the item, and we'll welcome you to speak. I do have a real quick question. <laughs> and as a former dancer. Yes. And I have a quick question about just, just clarification. How do you do distance? learning dance. What does that look like? <laughs> Video conferencing, no. Um, actually, I had a conversation with Kelly McCann, who is our professor that teaches dance, the dance program and the one that developed this degree on that. Uh, some, of the element, some of the elements can actually be deliver, delivered. The lecture type components can be delivered through distance education, but not necessarily the entire class. Um, so yeah, if, if you're dancing, you're probably all going to be actually in the studio dancing. I probably would have got a better grade if it had been distance. <laughs> What's that song when you have the choice to sit it out or dance? Yeah. All right. So we are electronically voting. Has everybody yes. voted, Cynthia? 14.1 passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, 14.2, ratify financial documents. Can we get a motion first and a Move second? Approval. Second. So who moved? I did. Okay. Motion to approve Raphael and Michael second. Questions? Yeah, I asked this question. I already got the answer, but I, I think it's cool, so I thought I wanted to share it. So I wanted um, Mr. Parker to talk about the $25,000 for a food truck. It is pretty cool. So if you go to the back end of campus next to the SBDC building, you will see the food truck. It is here. And so actually it's uh, Vice President Shearer who can probably speak more to what the program will do with that food truck, but it's something that was purchased using career technical education funds for the hospitality program. Yeah, so you may remember the trip that you did to the culinary kitchen here on campus in... December, I think it was December, uh, December when we went in there and saw the students doing their final. So Merrick McKeague, our professor in that area, has teamed up with uh, Diana Shabodi, his dean, and they are in the process of developing this food truck that's going to be an extension of our culinary and hospitality management program. This is an area of, of great interest for people. This is a fantastic entrepreneurial area also in the, in the uh, culinary and hospitality arena. So this is going to provide our students with hands-on experience in running and operating um, a kitchen out of a food truck. Um, the, uh, the students already thought, that, or actually some of them were staff, thought that we actually had a food truck parked on that end of campus and started queuing up for it the first day that it uh, show, showed up over there. But um, we're really excited about this, and this is, a, is an extension of the work that uh, they're doing in the culinary and hospitality program. So expect to see um, our truck around. And College Eats, I think, is what we are calling it. So it almost it, it almost looks it like looks collegiate if you see it quickly. Um, so call, the, it's going it? to be the College Eats. I thought it truck. was Scholar Eats. Scholar Eats, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Schol it's Scholar Eats my um, is, is is going to be the the, the name for it. So um, yeah, yeah, and it's it's great. This is actually a collaborative effort with the welding program, the machine tool technology program, and other programs that are actually going to be doing the retrofitting on the truck and getting it up to speed for what they need to do with their kitchen. So everybody on that into campus is, is involved with it. Very cool. We could start our own off the grid. Yes. <laughs> Question? 
Yes. Are we still asking questions on this? Yes. Um, on, uh, in, in, in the document, if you open it up, I wanted to ask about the coast landscape management from February 21st. It was $12,000. I was wanted to know what that was for. Like, what did we do near the, it says landscaping near the bus stop. What, what was that? anybody knows? Sure. So it, it was actually a combination. We had Coast come in to do a few things um, over the holiday break and it extended into uh, the month of January and actually into February. So it was, if you notice, out by the bus stop and the walkway leading from the bus stop to the campus, new planting took place, new bark was placed um, around there to improve the look and, and quite honestly improve the ability to maintain that area. They also did the area out here in the library plaza at the same time. It looks great. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, and I believe everybody, has everybody voted? Trustee Segura, did you vote? Wait, wait, wait. I there never saw any, I never saw anything. Did I vote? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> so long ago. Fourteen point two passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we're to fourteen point three refund existing Series C bond, and we have Mr. Leon Browning that would like to comment on this. Sure. After presentation, before deliberation. Yes. Okay. Do you want one of these up? Uh, the update. So what you're seeing, information was uh, presented to the Audit and Finance Committee at their last meeting regarding refunding of these uh, Series C bonds. And we've spoken to you about the possibility to do this at previous board meetings. These are bonds that became callable in August of uh, 2017. And so we were approached by a number of bond underwriters with uh, information and proposals for refinancing these bonds and the ability to save uh, money, uh, taxpayer dollars uh, uh, in uh, servicing the bonds. If we refund the bonds with bonds at current interest rates, we would see significant savings over the remaining life of, uh, of the bonds. And so presented the information to the uh, Audit and Finance Committee. And there are two types of bonds. There are capital appreciation bonds and there are current interest bonds. And the Series C bonds that we're looking to refinance are capital appreciation bonds. And so capital appreciation bonds, what it means is that you don't pay interest until the end when you actually refund or pay out the principal amount. And so the interest keeps accruing on those bonds and keeps compounding over the life of the bonds. We received proposals from three um, bond underwriters. Um, all three of them proposed refinancing these capital appreciation bonds with another set of capital appreciation bonds. But Morgan Stanley provided us with a proposal that would refund these capital appreciation bonds with convertible capital appreciation bonds. And what that means is that for the first three years, they would remain, the new bonds would be capital appreciation bonds, but in year four, they would convert to current interest bonds and would be current interest bonds for the remaining life of the bonds. When we talked about this at the Audit and Finance Committee, they asked that we go back and get a proposal that would, that would reflect immediately refinancing the capital appreciation bonds with current interest bonds. So what you see on the screen right now are the savings going from these cabs to convertible cabs, which would convert to current interest bonds in the year 2021. And you can see that the present value savings 
is approximately $10.2 million. Total savings, cash flow savings of 15.3, the current value of those savings, 10.2 million. If we move to the next slide or, or next section, um, Okay, here we go. So this would be immediately refinancing the CABs or capital appreci appreciation bonds with current interest bonds. What you see, however, is in those first three years of refinancing, there are significant negative tax rate savings or tax rate increases if we immediately go to current interest bonds. The important thing to note there is that under Proposition 39, which is the proposition that allowed community colleges, school districts, and other public entities to finance using general obligation bonds with a 55% uh, 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 vote of the local taxpayers, community colleges are limited to $25 per $100,000 of assessed value. And so in the first three years, those negative tax savings would push us significantly above that $25 limitation. And so that's why Morgan Stanley, and by the way, I have, we have with us tonight Karma Pemba from Morgan Stanley, who is the one who's been working with us and putting this information together to assist me in answering any questions that you might have about this proposal. But that is why we're recommending, because of those negative tax savings in the first three years, that we refinance using the convertible CABs, which would be capital appreciation bonds for only the first three years, and then convert to current interest bonds going forward. What you would be approving tonight is a resolution allowing us to move forward with that bond refinancing. We'd be coming back to you at the April board meeting with a full document that would be issued at the time that we issue the bonds. That's basically a disclosure form that includes information about California community colleges in general, about Napa Valley College, and about the city and county of Napa and assessed values in the city and county. And that's information that would be provided to potential purchasers of the bonds to demonstrate the value in investing in those bonds. Thank you. So, um, so maybe, so let's do this. Before the board asks any questions, let's have Mr. Browning come up and uh, make comments or ask questions that he may have. Thank you, Leon Browning. Um, <clears throat> I was at that meeting with the committee uh, in January, and I was, I, <laughs> I was kind of shocked because the only proposal was to replace cabs with cabs. Well, cabs are toxic. They have a very, very negative history. In fact, most of them now are uh, prohibited by the state because uh, some of them went as much as seven to 10 times the uh, total amount in interest. Um, I don't think the college did any of those. I think you were about four times the uh, principal amount in interest. But anyway, the, to have only cabs presented to refund cabs, I thought was shocking. And so I suggested that they go back because what was what was provided was simply a proposal from one lender that found out that these uh, these uh, bonds were callable. I said, "Well, go back, look look some more, find somebody else." But, but we definitely want CIBs, which are uh, current interest bonds. And um, I think if you look at the chart overall, I looked at them earlier today, and it looks to me like <clears throat> the biggest savings in in the three different proposals, cabs for cabs, cabs for convertible cabs, cabs for sibs, the biggest savings is in cabs for sibs. Is that not correct overall? Overall, that is correct. Okay. It does, however, violate $25 per 100000 of assessed value in the first three years. As I understand it, that's only uh, required for the first year of the, of the bond. 
So if we could continue with com your comments, and if you have any questions, then after they can come back up and okay, so uh, address that. And then further, my my comment would be: which of these uh, is the least overall cost? Because there are refinancing costs, there are loan fees that uh, the college is going to have to pay also. But I would strongly recommend that we go to CIB's current interest bonds. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Bob, if you want to also invite. Sure. Uh, let's. Um, so, let's have a motion to approve the resolution or motion on the resolution and then. A second, and then we can open up any questions. So move. Second. Baldini moves to approve, and Iverson second. Any questions? I, I just want to clarify that what's being proposed is that to do, do the convertible. Is that what's being approved or being moved to approve? That is what's being proposed. Yeah. Could could you address the question about? Hold, hold on. Oh. Hold, hold on. Rios. I just want to clarify, uh, I mean, before Mr. Browning spoke, I had the same question um, about the uh, convertible uh, interest bonds. So the, uh, these would violate the law those first three years because it's, so we can't actually use the, uh, going straight to the SIBs? You could technically use the SIBs, but what would happen is you would be over the $25 tax rate. That's, um, that's a violation in terms of if you had issued the first time around. Since this is a refunding, technically you could potentially go over the $25. But then, um, uh, as uh, Mr. Parker said, for community college districts, the general idea is to stay within $25. But your, so your current tax rate is twenty three dollars and eighty cents for this year. So, but this this does show the the greatest amount of savings. So, what is the drawback of us going to the SIBs? I mean, is there money we have to pay out, um, or what? What is it? The, the the biggest drawback is just the increase in tax rates in the first few years. So, so I, yeah, I think. Are you wanting comments at this point? Or, or wait. So we can do it. It's not illegal. You're just saying it would, right, it would mean more money from taxpayers. If this was a new money transaction, the, as Mr. Parker said, $25 is a, it's a hard threshold. You can't go over 25 Since this is a refunding, potentially you could go over 25 but there's obviously policy reasons that you'd want to stay within the maximum legal allowable. Do we have a board policy saying, saying that we have to stay within always, whether it's the first year or ever? Because I've never seen anything like that. I mean, so it sounds to me like it's not a legal requirement then. We're not legally obligated to stay within that $25. You're legally required for new money transactions. But this is not a new money this transaction. Is not a new money. So we're not legally required in this transaction to stay within that 25 You'll have to talk to uh, bond council. will be able to weigh in on that. So, okay, one, one more question. So does this mean that the taxpayers would be paying a higher amount those first three years? Correct. Okay, thank you. So do we have an idea of how much more, uh, what that comes out to? So actually on this slide, it shows you that in year one, it would be $1.20 more. Years two and three, it would be almost $7 more. And that's per $100,000 of assessed value. And then in year four, it would be approximately a dollar more. Question. question. Is Trustee there, Iverson. What's the, the risk of going with the, without doing the cabs for the first three years? What is there, other than the policy and the threshold of 25, is there? It's just the, it is the negative impact on the taxpayers of the significant increase in the per $100,000 of assessed value charge. Trustee Martinson. I just had two questions. I'm wondering, um, does this savings 
take into account any fees for refinancing these loans? Is that built into these savings? So that won't, there won't be costs on top of this? Uh, everything you see here is built in with cost associated already. Obviously, this is a snapshot in time. Okay, and then, rates will change. and then my second question is, um, is there any penalty for like early payoff? Are we obliged to stick with this uh, pay, payout schedule? Could we pay it off earlier if we wanted to, or is there a, a fine associated with that? So there's something called a, a call option. As Mr. Parker mentioned, the, these bonds were issued in 2007, and so the first time you could call them was in 2017. The new bonds would be, have another call feature, potentially somewhere between five to 10 years. And so if you'd want to uh, refund them again in the next five to 10 years, you have to wait for that period. Thank you. Yes. Um, just one question. Are, are we aware, is there any current litigation um, brought to bear on this, this particular issue that you're aware of, or case law that would bar a community college from, you know, kind of piercing that, that assessment value? You know, I have not seen litigation. This is unlimited ad valorem taxes, so mm -hmm. potentially the tax rate could go up as high as the right. county determines it's needed. However, uh, I'd, I'd feel more comfortable leaving it to Bond Council's determination if we could go up uh, next year. And Who, who's Bond Council? Is that our, we have Bond Council? Yes, so it's David Kasnoka from the Straddling firm, and he's the one who put together the resolution that you see before you tonight. So we don't know what he thinks about that point, about the first three years uh, using CIBs. What I would also say is your resolution has the flexibility of issuing cabs, convertible cabs, or current interest bonds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you decide, to, you know, you pass the resolution today, but you decide that you'd want to actually go with the second scenario, you have that option in the future uh, as we go down the process. I think we want to get that in writing, though. So I want to move to amend the motion to approve. Um, converting from cabs to CIBs pending uh, bond council's approval. Sure, so let me just say that as, as Karma just mentioned, the resolution that you would be approving tonight allows us to do any of those items. So it could be cabs to cabs, it could be cabs to SIBs, it could be cabs to convertible cabs that convert to SIBs. The other thing I'll say about the $25 limit is that most districts, certainly the districts that, that I'm familiar with, um, have chosen not to exceed the $25 per 100,000 in assessed value because when they went to the voters to seek approval of the first bond measure, they indicated that the tax would not exceed $25 per 100,000 of assessed value. Can we do it at this point? Yes, we can, but most districts have opted not to do that because it is in effect doing something that we promised the taxpayers we would not do. Okay, I think we're ready to vote and there is that information in the resolution. If right. you'll read the uh, whereas, it gives that option. I guess so, do, do you want direction as far as, because it's coming back to us at the next meeting, correct? So what will come back to you, we need to know at tonight's meeting whether it is cabs, convertible cabs, or SIBs outright, because what will be coming back to you at the next meeting is the document that actually indicates what we will be issuing and the dollar amount that we will be issuing. Okay, so I wanna go on record that I support the cabs to CIBs just because I understand that there's increased costs in the short term, but I think that we can explain that in the longer term, we're saving taxpayers $2 million. I, I tend to, to agree with that. I don't like the idea of kind of surprising the taxpayers with you know, higher uh, payments. I, Same. The cabs to the CIB. And that comes with a $25 cap. <laughs> Is that right? No? Okay. I think we've got that. I think. Uh, yeah, I think. 
But you're saying you support the cabs to the CIBs? You're right. Okay. I uh, echo. That doesn't. So if we're, I, I, I guess I'm a little confused now. If, okay. if we go from cabs immediately to SIBs, then the tax rate will spike in the first three right. years. I, I meant the first three years convertible. The convertible. First, yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Chair. The original Sorry, motion, on, right? The original motion, yep. correct. Ask a question. But we do have a, we, we had an we amendment. We have a motion. We, we have a, well, Can we, we have, have an amendment, but. There was not the second no in order. Second. I, there was no second, so. Because we kind of got sidetracked, so I'll move. I move to amend the motion that we move to refinance directly to CIBs. That's my amended motion. But is the motion is to approve the resolution? Well, the, the, as the, a what whole. the district presented was that we do these CIBs, the cabs to convertible cabs. That was what was on the agenda, correct? That is correct. So that was the emo the original motion. So I'm moving to amend the motion that we instead refinance from cabs directly to CIBs. So, and which would lead to a spike in the first three years, but long term savings. Okay, so just to make sure that everybody's clear what that amendment is, is, is the amendment caps to CIBs immediately, right, which will potentially cause an increase uh, for the taxpayers. In the first three years. It, it, it's not going to be potentially. It's definitely going to be an increase. Okay, definitely. All right, so uh, there's an amendment to the motion. Is there a second? No second. So we'll go back to the original motion. And um, can I ask a question before the motion's made? Or has the motion already been made? I mean, on the that? motion's already been made. Got it. OK. So we have a motion. We had a second. We did? Yes. Oh, to the first motion. To the first motion. So. All right. And then we have voting up. So was there so there's no second to the amended motion is that there was no second okay. to the amended motion Can you put me down as abstain please Has everyone voted? Who are we waiting on? Waiting for um, Trustee Seguro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, motion passed, um, six approved, one opposed by um, Trustee Seguro, and one abstention. Thank you. We will move on to 14.4. Human Resources document. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Baker moves to approve and Sandu second. I'm sorry, who are the approvals? Well, Sandu, who, um, who, who moved? I, I moved it. And you moved it. Baker moved and Sandu second. It'll be right there. It's pausing. What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, there's no actual motion written, so I have to put something in there for it to actually go online. Oh, okay.
I'll correct the spelling. Fourteen point four passed unanimously. Thank you. Fourteen point five extension of contract with uh, CWDL. <laughs> Move to approve. Second. Martinson moved to approve. Baldini second. Fourteen point five passed unanimously. Thank you. 14.6 contract with Garland DBS Inc. to replace roof on lower portion of the gymnasium building, building 600. I have a question on this. Yes, let's, let's get a motion and a second and then we can open up questions. Move approval. Second. second. Baldini first <laughs> and Rio second. And questions? As I get more acclimated with the process we have at the college, um, I was wondering how we came to decide to use them to do the construction and not someone else. Because I know for the student housing, we've had proposals and requests for qualifications, and I don't remember seeing this on the agenda before. Bob. Yeah, so um, this is actually a continuation of work on the uh, gymnasium building. This particular company, Garland DBS, did the uh, upper portion of the gym roof uh, uh, earlier this year. It actually took place over the summer. We're using this company. They, we are actually able under um, state code to use existing contracts that have been negotiated for other uh, governmental agencies so that we don't need to do competitive bidding or an RFP process because someone else has already done that. And this company won that competitive bidding process. And so that's how we determined for the first contract that we were going to go with this particular company. Does that help? One follow-up sure. question. go ahead. Are they still the most cost-effective company to do the job? Yes. That, that, that state contract or that governmental contract continues for a period of years. Thank you. Thank you. Fourteen point six passed unanimously. I didn't vote. You did. Mm -mm. Did it come up? It did. Okay, maybe I'm. <laughs> Should just... I change it? Do you want me no, to it's it? fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> did, did, is there a reason why we skipped 14.5? We didn't. We didn't. Well, she went, <laughs> well, she went directly to 14.6. To why did we do 14.6 before 14.5? It is getting late. I, I, I called it C, CWDL. You voted for it. <laughs> Okay, 14.7, 14.7, is everyone paying attention? Move approval. <laughs> ah. I got a motion from Baldi oh, Baker and a second from Iverson. Any questions, comments? All right, shall we vote? I saw you vote. On the electronic system, are you getting my votes? Some. Some? I need to look at that. Yeah, do you have, would you want to just tell me? No, it's funny because I'm not getting them on my screen at all. <laughs> now? Oh. Do you want to give me your vote? It's yes for everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Let's just do that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, 14.7 passed unanimously. <laughs> okay. 14.8. 
Agreement for Teaching Services on Alante Program, Summer 2018. Move for approval. Second. Iverson moved to approve. Segura, second. Any questions? Move to vote. Fourteen point eight passed unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Orton. I know you have a comment on fourteen point nine, but if you would, yeah, wait for after the presentation. there yes, there is no presentation. But after I make my comment, if you still feel a need, I will happily allow. Um, so let me just grab my notes here. Okay, so. 14.9, what I would like to do here is, is due to the Mount Vedder fires, opportunities that have arisen that continue to come up based on uh, you know housing and community partnerships and revenue generating partnerships like we just you know potentially had with the Silverados that we approve. There's so many of these great opportunities that are coming up that I would like to propose that we um, move the ad hoc committee to a standing committee. And um, I would, and that's really all that I have to say about this particular item. And I'd be really excited if the board uh, decides to move forward on that. I, um Let's let, before we start to deliberate, let's let Mr. Orton. Okay, thank you very much. Based on Mr. So Orton, let's make a, let's, speak, I'll move for approval okay. on ad hoc real property management committee to a standing committee. Second. Okay, so we have a first a motion from Iverson and a second from Rios. Questions? Yes. I just have a clarifying question. Something you said, you, you mentioned the, like the Silverados, but that wouldn't, something like that wouldn't fall, would that no. fall under the purview of this committee? And I was using an example of just. That's more facilities. That's not property, correct? That one is, that one would not fall under this one probably. Yeah. Although if you had a standing committee. Right. You get more input. You get them something you know. to do. But if, it, it, anything that, uh, you know, I guess what I was, I was trying to get across was anybody who might come to us could be vetted through that committee um, in some way. So Can we call it something else besides ad hoc committee? Yeah. It won't be called an ad hoc okay. committee. It'll be a standing, standing. committee. Yeah, it's about every exit. Any question? Uh, real Any other questions? Okay. Martin said, so just a under. comment. Um, if this committee is going to continue to exist, I definitely think it should be a standing committee. I, I've been saying that from the beginning, but I, I, I'm just questioning why we need this committee at all. And, and he, my concern is that it's moving into these operational um, things that I don't think the board should be involved in. So unless we're going to really clarify that its purpose is to remain to deal with property issues, but at a policy level, to make sure that we're following board policy, to, if there's gaps in board policy, to bring forth changes to board policy, then I would agree with it. But otherwise, I think there's too much of a tendency with this particular committee to be getting involved in operations that aren't appropriate for our board members to be getting involved in. And I, I just don't think we need it. I feel like we, when these issues should be dealt with as a whole board, when it's appropriate to be at the level of the board, I don't think we need board members being involved in these land use issues. That's just my opinion. I'd rather see it just go away. But if it's going to exist, then it needs to be standing. I would like to uh, to ask. I would like to first of all, also with this request to roll over the existing committee into this standing committee, and uh, leave it as I believe Mr. Baldini is chair. So uh, comments from the committee. Well, I'll I'll put it right back to the uh, to the um, the board chair. We we do have a a mission statement. Is that Mm -hmm. And that'll transfer over. 
so I, I, I don't see it as um, interviewing. I, I see it more on a topical rather than nuts and bolts, bringing it back to the board, updating the board on, on potential, um, and, and then the board directing our president superintendent uh, to make a decision whether it's uh, to devote staff time to it or not and his reasons, but it, um, uh, yeah, that's how I, I'd look at it. So you'd be bringing forth recommendations for the board to direct yeah, for the, to the full the president board. to look into certain land use issues that is, that is or, or policies right. related to land use. Yes. That's how I see it. I might rec do recommend, though, that perhaps a name change would be in order. I don't know what it would be, too, but the, using the word management makes it does make it sound like it's operational. And so I don't know what a al good alternative might be, but... Issues, uh, real property issues, maybe. Yeah, or something like that. And it's just, the word management makes it sound like, uh, I don't know, it just makes it sound like... we're actively yeah, engaged like you, yeah, in, like in, in the process. What, uh, what right. I would suggest is that uh, we amend, that someone could amend the motion by just adding uh, that the committee, to move that the committee be a standing committee, but that there would be a proposed name change at our next meeting or something like that. Yeah. I guess I'm just I'm so that we have time to to yeah. so that they have time to really think about it. And I I would hate to go. Let's change the name right this minute right, okay. and not. Um, I, I, I would move that. Do, do that? I have to say it again? <laughs> I think so. Okay, I would move that. Um, the ad hoc real property management committee be changed to a standing committee and that the, that group have opportunity to come with a name change option at the next meeting. Is that what you said? Second. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to say one more thing really quick before we vote. I just, I, I'm going to vote for it because I don't want it to be a temporary committee anymore, but I guess I want to just put out there that being mindful of staff time because standing committees obviously take staff time and it seems like once we create a standing committee we never go back and get rid of these standing committees so anyway I, I, I guess I again I don't feel we need it but I'm gonna vote for it because I don't want it to be temporary anymore I want it to be standing and subject to the Brown Act at least okay so uh, we have a first we have a second and then we had an amendment by Baker oh, sure. with a second by Iverson? Mm -hmm. Was that correct? Right. Okay. So we're voting on the amendment? Yes. So we are voting on the amendment. All right. Can we vote? No. Oh. <laughs> the other one was on the screen. Um, but I can, you can either wait and I can put it on, or you can just vote it and I'll add it on to the minutes after. Which would you prefer? Yeah, that's fine. To wait? A second. The second. Go ahead and write it, I think is what they're saying. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. Discussion is closed. The lights go out at 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm voting yes on the amendment, OK? <laughs> it's going to be on the screen. <laughs> All right. Cynthia, I thought they, they meant that you don't have to enter it in here. I'm that sorry. you could just write it by handwrite it later, just get the vote on the amended motion. And then we can we can correct that in the minutes as you have time, a little more time. So Trustee Baker amended the motion. Uh -huh. Trustee Iverson, Iverson seconded. Iverson second, yes. And now call for the vote. Should we just do it verbally? Well we're gonna take the vote that was the original vote put forward but she's going to make the I'm minutes ahead. read right. that uh, we voted on the amendment that's correct okay. aye and okay, so that's up, being that and that's aye. being the amendment recorded aye, aye. Oh, no. aye on the amendment <laughs> <laughs> was that unanimous yes that an advisory so the amendment's unanimous i'm just checking yes. <laughs> okay I, thank yes. you all right that was great so we will move forward with 15.1 ad hoc committee reports. Point of order. Okay. Did you vote on the resolution? Okay, so we still have to vote on the first one. Wait. 
Hmm? No. Not if it passed. No, we're good. We oh, the second one. Okay. We're motion, good. So we're yes. good. Okay. <laughs> you confused me. <laughs> okay. Ad hoc committee reports. There was no meeting. Thank you. There's no ad hoc committee anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, 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 it is an interesting point in the law, right? <laughs> <laughs> they were until now, exactly. Standing committee reports. Uh, Segura, dot, uh, das. Das, das, we met. Goodness gracious, where are my notes? We met last Thursday, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we could go today. And so we went over our financials, which showed uh, a deficit of $19,000 plus. But that was due because we finally paid staff from the cafe. Um, and so it, it looks like a negative on paper. Um, also, you just approved the uh, agreement with uh, Migrant Ed. We will be providing lunches for the students that come. So that was a real good opportunity. And there was something else, and I lost my notes, and I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Ah, yes. Uh, we're thinking about changing vending machines or getting another contract with another company. Okay. To capitalize on money. And that's it. Thank you. Quick question. You said that you'll be providing lunches. Who is we? They'll be by the cafe. Okay. <laughs> are, we allowed, are we allowed to ask that's questions? Right. Or not? No. We're not. It's 10.30. No. <laughs> she, was, she just needed no, a clarification. Yeah, I, no. What if the wasn't. master agreement, is that still being reviewed or is that done? It's still being reviewed. Okay. All right. We will move on to Viticulture and Winery Foundation. Did have a meeting. It, uh, we were presented with the foundation, the Napa Valley College Foundation's a draft presentation that they're going to make to the vintners and the Farm Bureau that, that was brought up by Ann. We haven't seen the finish. Uh, it would be nice to present to the full board so we can see what's going out there and also rally or you know, support in some way or whatever way possible. The, um, and uh, some update on the vineyards, update on the, on the wines, uh, some problems with different pests, particularly raccoons and other vermin out in the vineyard getting an early harvest on the, on the fruit. Uh, also the potential for some uh, smoke taint as most of the Napa Valley is looking at right now. Financially, we're sound according to Mr. Parker. And uh, next meeting next quarter. Thank you. Legislative Affairs Committee. Uh, we have not met. I asked the committee to wait until uh, this past week when I or maybe that was just yesterday. I can't remember. <laughs> um, but I spent the day in Sacramento with legislators and wanted to observe some legislation that I thought might be interesting to us and um, did some lobbying on behalf of uh, California Workforce Association. So um, we will be now setting up a time to meet, and um, I'll talk about some of that in my board report. Audit and Finance Committee, you met, um, right? No? No, not since the last meeting. Our next meeting is uh, Thursday, April 26 at 4 p.m. here in the boardroom. Okay. And McPherson, have you met? No. And I guess we skip number six, or no? No, we, well, we'll take this opportunity. Obviously, okay. we'll be doing business as yet to be named. Uh, but uh, do my colleagues have any idea when, when uh, for a meeting window or what works best for, for you, given our, our load? And where is it? Is it Upper Valley Campus at, uh, or somewhere else down here? No. no uh, he's be, talking uh, to Raphael Iverson, and uh, Kyle. Kyle Iverson and Raphael. Pardon me? And an email Yes, I, I shall, and I'll follow up with, yes. <laughs> I wonder why he would say that. Yes, but thank you. Thank you. 
okay with our, our process that we have in place for agenda items. I will now ask uh, if there are any future agenda items. And I believe, Baker, you? Yeah, I'm not really certain what format this would take, um, but I was curious about either opening a conversation, discussion, or maybe coming up with a resolution of some sort having to do with gun control. Um, I think it's, I, I, I know that there's perhaps a, a little difference of opinion on whether or not it's within our purview, but given our current climate, I think it's at least something we should talk about and see if there is something, uh, a, a mechanism for us to move something. So I think that, um, I was thinking maybe this is something that could go to the, well, maybe not the legislative committee, maybe it's, no. maybe it's something staff could take a stab at. We certainly have board, existing board policies on this, which we could, we could unpack and information, so you'd be deeply, you know, uh, educated on it. Yep. Um, and we could call on the police chief to help us unpack that, so you'd know exactly what we have, and if there's room on the edges of that or in the middle to support or add or whatever it might be. That'd be that, that's what I would. Does recommend. that sound like a good plan? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, and I think that if I understand what Trustee Baker would like to accomplish is a position on, uh, you know, the conversations about arming teachers and all of those things and guns all over campus silencers. and things like that. So um, <laughs> that's, I think we're definitely getting into board purview okay. when we're in that, okay. in that area. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. And um, any, any other, yes, ma'am. I, I would have to, clarify with ASNVC on this, but it would be, I think it would be beneficial if some students who attend the DC conference maybe come to the public, uh, come to the board meeting and present on what they gained from going to that. Absolutely. As mm -hmm. maybe as one of the, as a presentation. You want to do that as a presentation and put that on the agenda? I would, I personally okay. would like to see that, but I would check with RAF and just ASNVC if they're okay with that, but that's something I would so like you like could, after you, after you talk with the rest of the board, yeah. then an email could come from the president of ASNVC and let us know if you'd like that to be agendized. Mm -hmm. We have two processes. It's this and then email that goes to uh, Dr. Kraft and myself. So would that email be to, to you CCing Dr. Kraft or the vice versa? Or goes to we, both? Both. We already have. We've, it's fine. We've captured it now. Yeah. So I'll be reaching out and to see whether or not it would be in Raphael's vantage point now. And then, and then once I receive that info, I'll forward it to the chair and then we'll talk about <laughs> how best. Or, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Other agenda items, Trustee Martinson. Okay, so mine are kind of getting backed up because I've asked them several meetings ago, so I'm not to keep the, the list gets longer, but so several meetings ago, I asked to have on the agenda the audio, re audio recording of our meetings by Napa Broadcasting, and that still hasn't been put on the agenda, and I know we got a little update, but th that doesn't address my issue, so I'm again requesting that that be agendized so that the board can discuss whether or not we want to continue that. It, um, it was the board that decided to do that when we didn't have video. Um, and we're paying for that, and now we have video, and so I'd like the board to weigh in on whether we want to continue that. Um, second, I had emailed. Let's, can I just address that real quick? So, the item, so it wasn't, it went, wasn't an agendized item right. to vote on it. Exactly. It so wasn't an action item that I understood. It was just that we agendized it to get the information and see if the rest of the board had. Um, any information right. on that so so if we could agendize that either way as an information discussion item I don't care but I'd like to have that on the agenda but I just want to clarify that it was agendized as requested when today it was in the president's report and it wasn't even put forward until at the meeting so, so that it did, it did come out 
as requested. So what you are asking to agendize now is an action item to vote up or down on continuing paying $200 to Napa Broadcasting for audio recording, if I'm understanding. Either way, I, I remember how it came about. It came about as an information discussion item, and we gave direction to do that. So it could come back as an information discussion. So we I can provide direction, or it can be an action item. I don't care. Trustee Either Rios. way. Just a, a qu question, comment. Isn't that a contract? Don't we have a contract for that? We don't. And, and if we do, wouldn't the appropriate time be at the time that that comes up? Uh, I, I it's think not in the this is, if, if I understand separate. correctly, and Ron can, can clarify this, this is kind of like we passed a budget and staff decides how to spend that money on what paper company to use to buy paper and... And, and this kind of falls into that um, Okay, we're discussing it now. <laughs> and I would just like to have it put on the agenda. That was my request. So well, if that could happen, please. We need to verify that it's something that... Um, it, it, the board decided to do that. And so the board can decide not to do that. And it's not in the contract. It was outside the contract. It's not in the contract with Napper Broadcasting. It was a decision of the board when we didn't have video as an alternative to video. We now have video, so it's up to the board to decide if we want to continue paying for that service that we no longer need. So Rios so like had a question. He wanted to know if it was a contract. Ron, do you just want to add, answer that? And then we can just... For sure. Agendize it. I guess I could address the attorneys in the room, but it, it's a, it's, it is an oral contract. There are stipulations and material. Um, um, there's consideration on one side, and there are um, commitments on the other side. So, And I don't know through DAS if we've created an addendum to this. I don't believe we did. We agreed. Certainly there's a paper trail on this, which is, you know, emails, you know, this level of service for these kinds of things. But it, it, but it is a... Uh, I'd hate to see it as an up and down piece because then we'd have to replace and repeal, if you will. Uh, repeal and replace, maybe is a better way to say that. So, so you said right. it's an oral contract. It's an oral agreement yeah. that came out of a board decision. So it's within mm -hmm. the board purview. So I'd like to see it come back. And so that's my first. The second. Is it a DAS? It, it is not part of the facilities use agreement. Right. It's separate. Yeah, exactly. It, it came separate. out of a board decision. That's why it's appropriate for the board to to change that. So that's one. The second, um, I had sent an email that I would like the minutes and the bids and contract board policies to come forward for a policy change. Wait, say that again. I'm sorry. I missed the that. minutes and the bids and contracts policy. I sent an email that I wanted those to come forward for a potential policy change. Um, neither one affects the other constituencies. The minutes is under Chapter 2, which is our policies, they're mm -hmm. our purview. And I basically wanted to add in, in the standing committees that we would take minutes at the standing committee meetings, um, which came out of a discussion with our audit and finance committees that it obviously was going to take a policy change to make that happen. Um, so I wanted to bring forward that policy. Um, and then I also emailed that I wanted the bids and contracts policy to come forward. Um, because in the absence of having an attorney here, I thought a simple reassurance would be to add language that any uh, contract or bid that had been reviewed by uh, council be signed off as such. Be, for example, I found a template that often they're signed off as proved as to form, and then the lawyer signs off. And that way we at least know what was approved, what wasn't approved, and um, we can have that reassurance. So those were the two uh, policies that I wanted to come forward. Thank you. We will uh, put that on the list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Point of clarification, so maybe Carolee, no, policies coming from any of the constituency groups would work their way through the Council of Presidents as an initiator, correct? Um, everything except Chapter 2. Except so Chapter 2. The, so this the one bids would be and contracts a, a different would, path, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Trustee reports. Let's start with uh, student trustee Sandu. I will be going to DC next week to attend the American Student Association for Community Colleges and attend that conference. There, they'll talk about Pell Grants, student loans. There's a few bills we'll be looking at to see which ones we want to say that the organization should put forth to Congress. 
um, the second lady of California, I spoke to her a few weeks ago at a convention, and I, I asked her if she'd be interested in coming to the college to talk about patriarchy, uh, feminism. She has two documentaries on Netflix, The Mask You Live In and uh, uh, Misrepresentation, and I, I asked her if she'd like to come to the college and speak on those, and she expressed interest, and she told me to contact her chief of staff. And uh, I, her chief of staff got back to me saying they're busy this year with the election, which is, I, I guess, it's kind of busy. And uh, so to get back to them next year. So that's up in the works. And I'm optimistic that she'll, she'll come to the college. Uh, a few weeks ago, Dr. Kraft and I and Alexander Walker Griffin, the Board of Governors member, had a meeting with Dr. Kraft. So we did that. Uh, we will be having a Napa City Council debate hosted by ASNVC. We have two city council candidates who have agreed to come. So we're going to move forward with that. We've already reserved the pack. So letting you guys letting you guys know right now. We'll give more information as we get closer to it, but that's going to happen. And I would, uh, Michael Baldini and I would like to see a trash can placed behind right here <laughs> at this door. That concludes my report. Thank you. <laughs> Trustee Baldini. Yes, I, I echo my fellow trustee uh, uh, Man Bear's request. Um, we'll talk about it at the real property. Man no, it's a physicals <laughs> uh, a facilities thing. Uh, it, anyway, thank you and and thank you, board chair, for and board for making us uh, real as standing committee. And I was also appointed uh, chair of the for another term, the Napa Valley Transportation Authority Citizens Advisory Committee. And one of the items that we're talking about is a study, a new study that's going to start next month uh, looking at uh, traffic flows here in, in uh, Napa County, in and out at, at uh, 11 different points and every gateway in and out of the county, which will be uh, um, monitored and presented. It'll be three different periods this year, so we won't have results until probably November or, or first quarter of next year, but uh, give us an idea of not only uh, flows in and out of the um, college here, but uh, throughout the county and how it impact jobs, housing, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Baker, tell us about your exciting life. <laughs> been a quick month uh, as well, it relates to the college <laughs> well now <laughs> my report just got much shorter <laughs> I, I attended the uh, black history month at least for part of it then I had to uh, leave early for my dance class and so I was able to bring my dance partner with me to the program and forced him to eat uh, potato salad with mustard which is the way only way potato salad should ever be eaten in my opinion so um, just FYI, I don't know if this is something that's going to be uh, have an impact on the college, uh, but we've had a lot of discussion and I guess you would say preparation to mitigate um, issues around walkouts, um, particularly next week on the 14th. And then uh, the next one after that that would fall during the school day or school week would be April 20th. And the school district has been working with principals and teachers to really try to organize some activities to provide opportunities for the students to have civic discourse without, um, while still providing a safe environment where they remain in school. And they've come up with some really great ideas um, that I'd be happy to, to share if it's something that might... Um, be useful to the college community. So, that's all. Trustee. Trustee Martinson. Um, just a couple announcements. Um, so a few months ago, the board passed the resolution in support of Prop 13 reform. Um, and it was interesting because right after that, Evolve came out that they are collecting signatures to actually put that on the ballot. Um, and so if anybody's interested in volunteering for that, um, 
through the Evolve website, uh, you can sign up to collect signatures to put Prop 13 reform on the ballot to raise, um, basically, to, again, to cor close the corporate loophole on um, property taxes to raise money for higher education. Um, and then I went attended a workshop at the Unitarian Church on NVC, but in this case, it, what that stands for is nonviolent communication. And it was led by uh, a Roxy Manning, and it was excellent. And I thought that could be a good professional development workshop for this board or um, in the future. Um, just communications with the public. I maybe others did as well, but I did receive an email from Trish and newer board members don't know who that is, but everybody else knows who that is, I'm sure. I don't even know her last name. She doesn't need a last name. She's just Trish. But she was really involved in um, coming and speaking about the VWT program and trying to push it towards organic and biodynamic. And um, she's back. She, I think she's coming to our next meeting. Um, her concern is that we've started to move away from that and moved further away from organics. Um, last I heard, we were becoming an organic vineyard, and she claims that we've moved away from that. So anyway, there was a concern about that. Um, somewhat related, um, I'd announced that there was a, a speaker on um, glyphosate, which is Roundup, um, previously at the library, and there's actually going to be another pesticide forum um, that I'm helping organize that's going to be at the library on Wednesday, April 4th from 7 to 8.30 p.m., talking about the health risks of glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, and I just, again, think it's relevant as we look at our integrated pest management plan here at the college, uh, both on the campus in general and in also in the vineyard. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Trustee Rios. No report. You're too busy. Yes. <laughs> Trustee Segura. Black History Month, awesome. We should have more of those events. It was, it was great. And that's about it. Trustee Iverson. I don't have a report this evening. Thank you, because I have a really big report. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I don't know about big. Um, so one thing that I want to uh, mention is that I had an executive committee meeting for uh, the Workforce Board, Workforce Alliance of the North Bay, and uh, they brought up and I'll just leave this with somebody, I'm not sure who, but they brought up that we, um, that not all of our programs are uh, training providers, are approved training providers. And so they felt limited to what programs they could be referring people to. And that seemed odd to me. So anyway, if somebody could run with that, thank you and find out um, what exactly. We'll check it. We'll because, check it. yeah. Okay, thank you on that. And um, as I mentioned, I went to Crab Feed at American Canyon. There were about 500 people there. It's a really big event in, in AMCAN. And uh, I took the flyers and passed those out to everybody, and people were really excited about it because, as you know, American Canyon has lots of, lots of kids. And so they looked at an opportunity where it would be kid-friendly. Um, so that got great response. And then um, I want to mention what I did with the California Workforce Association at the Capitol. Um, I have Band-Aids all over my feet because of blisters that I wore <laughs> um, walking through the halls of the Capitol talking to legislators about legislation that affects workforce could all ultimately really be a benefit if this legislation moves forward for us. Uh, one of those bills that passed last year unanimously, except for one Republican down in San Diego who voted against it on the Senate, entire uh, unanimous vote in the, in the Assembly, and that was AB 1111. And... Um, and this bill is really, uh, you know, the bill, the bill passed, but the bill, the governor has not funded the bill. So it was basically meeting with legislators saying, you've got to get on the governor um, to fund this bill. And this bill is basically all about 
where our workforce is going to come from, because as we know we have such a workforce crisis that this bill will help the money, the funding, which is about $25 million ask that will come from this bill, uh, will lift people out of poverty and, you know, take the, the people who need it the most and put them into better wage jobs if they're underemployed, as well as moving them into the workforce, uh, which is such an important, such an important thing to do. Um, and hopefully, you know, everybody has equal opportunity to be gainfully employed and be making a good wage. So, and again, all of those things relate to uh, the, the workforce partnership with the training providers, us. And then the other was AB 2915 that we were talking to people about looking for co-sponsors. And that's an MOU. And the best way that we were explaining this is that in California, we had such a great uh, way of, of rapid response and um, first responders moving easily throughout the state to help with fires in various different areas. What we don't have is that same type of thing for uh, the workforce organizations to be able to move about the state as easily. So this is an MOU that provides workforce group in Sonoma to be able to immediately work in Napa and provide resources for people who need those resources uh, right away. So that was an MOU that is uh, Caballero from, uh, where is she from? I've lost it. Um, who said that? Monterey. Oh, Monterey. Ana yeah, Ana Caballero, exactly. She uh, is the one that is sponsoring this bill, and, and she's working on getting uh, co-authors. And uh, it's really a meaningful, a meaningful bill that will help us all. And then I just want to remind everybody that the TRIO uh, program celebration is tomorrow night at 5 p.m., and I hope everybody will make an effort to attend and bring tissue. And that's my report. And is there any need to uh, continue into closed session? Oh, goodness. No, there is not. Okay. So if not, I will adjourn this meeting at 1018. <laughs> Woo! Uh, looking good. I think she... Oh, no, you still lead. I think you still lead.